Okay, today we'll be conducting our, our meeting um, again virtually using uh, remote technology that allows us to gather uh, for this public meeting, uh, given relief from the open meeting law uh, that was issued in an executive order back in March by the governor. Uh, today is uh, Thursday, November 6th, and excuse me, November 5th, 2020. It is public meeting 325. Before we get just started today, I want to remind everyone that today we will again focus on the implications of the continuing uncertainty of the pandemic. Uh, there's some, yesterday, there's a new Massachusetts record since May 14th of confirmed coronavirus cases. And the United States recorded more than 100,000 new virus cases for the first time yesterday. So we want to um, renew our uh, gratitude for the medical community that is facing the challenge of um, the changing public health metrics. And we uh, <clears throat> you know, thank them for everything that they do to help heal those who are affected by the virus. With that, um, we want to get started on our meeting. Item number two, approval of the minutes, Commissioner Stebbins. Good morning, and thank you for that reminder, Madam Chair. Uh, in your packet, colleagues, you have the minutes from the August 13th, 2020 meeting. Uh, I would move their approval uh, subject to any corrections for typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Any edits that you have? Uh, Commissioner O'Brien? I do have just one um, wording suggestion at page three at 10, 13 a.m. Um, Director Band is talking about poker and then it concludes basically saying that it will, poker will not be resuming. Uh, I just think it needs to be phrased that um, he was not recommending that it resume since ultimately the decision to resume or not is up to the commission. So I just think the wording needs to say not recommending. Okay. Thank you. I'm just pulling up the minutes as well. Any other uh, edits that you'd recommend, Commissioner Zuniga or Commissioner Cameron? I have one suggested change to, I think it, it was, it's fair that it was complicated, but under 1101, I'm sorry, I don't have the, uh, them pulled up in front of me, but uh, the 1101 entry, Commissioner Stebbins, that was with respect to the independent monitor. Yes. Commissioner O'Brien, um, maybe you too also might want to help on the, on the clarification. First off, it does, rec does suggest that the chair made a recommendation. That would be the chair and Commissioner O'Brien. We work together um, with the independent monitor. And I think the, the real clarification, Commissioner Stebbins and Shara, is that uh, I believe you get to it in the second part of the, that section under 1105, but that um, the contract, we were recommending that the contract be between Mr. Pugh and Miller and Chevalier. Uh, I don't believe we ever have a contractual arrangement with Mr. Pugh's firm. So that's the clarification I'd like, uh, that it's strictly uh, our recommendation is that uh, Miller and Chevalier work out a subcontract, which is in fact what did happen. Am I right on that, Commissioner O'Brien? No, you are actually, yep. It's, so it should say um, the commission is in communication with um, Miller and Chevalier who is working on a contract with Mr. Pugh to retain him. Right. Okay. And I think that that's really the bottom line. If I read, um, I'm sorry, I don't have my notes. I'm going to pull this up on the next uh, more successfully than what I'm doing right now. It's okay. So that's that's just a, a, a point of clarification. Okay. Anything else on the minutes? All right. And um, do I have a second? I second with those amendments. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, Commissioner uh, I Cameron. abstain, Madam Chair. I was not present for that meeting. I'm trying to imagine where you were. It was August, <laughs> right? I, I, I was, 
Uh, yeah, I, I'm hoping that it was a good round or something. Yeah, I was. I can't remember. I was on the Cape for that week. <laughs> I can't remember that. And so, uh, you know, in terms of our virtual meeting, uh, that you were absent. But yes, okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Some one abstention. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. And I vote yes. Yeah. So for yeses and one abstention, and Commissioner Cameron, you did not have to tell us where you were. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's just hard uh, in this virtual reality, reality to remember where people might have been. So thank you. Um, moving on then to our administrative update, uh, Executive Director Wells, please. Good morning, Madam Chair, and members of the commission. I just wanted to start off uh, the administrative update, which is a job listing update. Uh, as the commission is aware, we've been uh, running a very lean shop, particularly during COVID. Uh, we're recognizing, you know, the economic strains that the uh, pandemic has put on not only licensees, the Commonwealth, uh, and we have been sharing in that burden and being very judicious about positions. However, um, there are three critical positions to our operations that were necessary to fill, so we do uh, have three open positions, and I just wanted to give you an update on those. Uh, the, all positions uh, are uh, on all of these positions. Uh, the team is working with uh, Jill Griffin uh, on the diversity end and with HR to enhance uh, the diversity of the applicant pool. Uh, so far, we have seen that to be very successful, so we're very pleased with those results and very encouraged by that. Uh, the uh, first position I just wanted to mention was the licensing division chief. That was the first one that was posted. We are in the final stretch uh, of that process and we are quite happy with how that is going. So we're hoping to have uh, some resolution to that quite soon and be able to report out on that. So that has been successful so far. Uh, we also have the IEB director. Um, position, that posting does close tomorrow. So any, any member of the public that is interested, I just wanted a reminder out there that that uh, date for that posting closes tomorrow. So uh, we have had um, uh, quite an interest in the position. Many resumes have come in. That is a high level position within the office. Uh, so I just wanted to remind uh, the public and the team here that uh, we'll be moving forward with that position. And that also within the general counsel's office, we do have an associate general counsel position uh, that is posted. Uh, and that still is open and they're still collecting resumes at, uh, for that position. Uh, all three of these uh, positions are great opportunities for people. They're um, great positions with interesting work and there's opportunities for career development uh, in taking those. So I just wanted to flag those for the commission, let you know they're moving forward and our enhanced process with our diversity efforts. We, we like how this is working and, and having Jill in the mix and getting some more um, outreach out there. So that's been very positive. Does any uh, commissioner have any question uh, about the process or any of the positions at this point? Um, yeah, thank you. I, I would just make um, a comment and recognize that um, just what you said at the beginning, that um, we've been uh, very much in a very lean type of yeah. operation and that's really fell these three positions on three key people who have stepped in uh, to do a lot of the work that would normally be done by, by others and, and specifically thinking of Loretta, Derek and Todd when yes. it comes to doing a lot of other functions that they normally do in addition to the ones uh, by virtue of the of the vacancies. I, I, it also it also means that they uh, uh, coordinate with others uh, like you Karen and other staff members but um, I just wanted to mention uh, their efforts uh, and I think also to uh, as you alluded at the end of, the, of your remarks that uh, it's great that we're getting a lot of interest but I, I think also in the past, it's been a good opportunity for internal candidates to be considered. Yes. And we, as our processes, do it in the same way that we've always done it. And, um, and um, I'm happy to hear that it's moving along. Thank you. And just a clarification, Karen, it's with these job listings, that it's, there is no expansion of our team. It's it's filling right. those positions. So again, to emphasize that we are cognizant of, of these times, certainly. Right, right. Yeah, it's, as Enrique pointed out, the people doing double duty, and you can only do that for so long uh, without 
uh, that being too much. So yeah. uh, I think this is appropriate given our resources, but we're, we're being very judicious in the, in the positions that we're filling. We're not uh, yeah. filling extra positions. Yeah, all three are uh, filling. Okay. Exactly. Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay, so uh, for the next part of the administrative update, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Lightbound just to give you an update on racing and what's going on there. Thank you. Hi, Alex. Hi, thank you. And uh, good morning, commissioners and, and Madam Chair. So um, about a week and a half ago, we had our finals for the mass bred races at the harness track called the Sire Stakes Program. Um, this program, as you've heard um, on other reports, has really taken off. Um, there were eight races that day, um, each giving out a purse of $90,000. Um, and this was preceded by um, three separate uh, heats of races um, starting in September for horses to qualify for these races. So um, that was a great uh, program. And even in those races um, leading up to the finals, the purses were around $30,000. So that program's getting quite a bit of money um, out to the breeders and um, owners in uh, Massachusetts and, and uh, the area. Um, just in general, uh, we've had uh, 49 judges ruling so far this season. And um, that's a, on, on par. Um, usually in a full season, we have around 100 and 20 or so. Um, so our judges have been very busy. Uh, the veterinarians and their um, veterinary assistants in the test barn um, have been busy also. We've done um, around 1,000 TCO2 tests, um, including 67 on the Sire Sticks final day. On that day, the um, Santa Brand owners of Massachusetts has asked us to test every horse in, the, in their finals races instead of, uh, usually we do two per race. So that was a big day for uh, testing. Um, again, um, everyone was very uh, good about complying with uh, that program. And um, we've done around uh, 600 blood and urine tests and 800 blood tests um, so far this year. Again, that's on par with um, what we would do um, in a normal year as far as um, a daily rate. Um, as you um, know that uh, Plain Ridge was able to get their Spirit of Massachusetts and Claire Barton races in, uh, the $250,000 Spirit of Mass and the Claire Barton for $100,000. Um, earlier this year, um, that was July 26th. Um, that was quite a feat. Uh, they could have easily canceled that race. As you know, we uh, opened for racing on the 13th of July. So that came up very quickly, um, but um, Steve O'Toole's staff um, was very good about uh, going ahead and getting everything done. So that uh, race, those two races could still go on. Um, we're scheduled to finish out the meet with about 68 days of live racing. Um, the last day of racing is November 27th. Um, so far this year, we've run in, raced in everything from uh, very hot weather in the middle of the summer to uh, Friday where it was freezing. So um, uh, kudos to our staff, particularly out in the um, testing area where um, they're exposed uh, more than the rest of our staff to the elements. Um, so that's a quick roundup. I know we have a, a busy schedule today. Um, if anyone has any questions. Uh, Dr. Lightbaum, um, with our um, significantly, significantly increased purses, as you just pointed out, um, it's nice to see that our violations, uh, i.e., um, you know, illegal substances, has not has not been an uptick. I, I believe I understood you to correctly to say that. You're right. We uh, this year so far we've only had two adverse. Um, yes, yeah, so and I lab, so. read what's happening nationally and the. Um, and the call for you know national reform. So it certainly is a tribute to everyone involved uh, with racing here in the uh, Commonwealth that we are able to uh, run races safely and that the integrity is such an important piece. So I, uh, I thank you and the team as well as all the participants for um, really abiding by the rules and, um, and making sure that the, the races are fair. So thank you for that report. Oh, thank you. Other questions? Commissioner Zuniga. Thank you. Just uh, perhaps just a comment that I think you alluded to. I was, um, Dr. Leipan, I was doing a little update on the annual report and looking at the 
a difference in disbursements uh, out of the Racehorse Development Fund this uh, latest fiscal year, which ended in, in, in June 30th. I know your update was more on the calendar um, year. Uh, and compared to the prior fiscal year, it was, well, uh, quite, quite a bit less uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, mostly uh, uh, that, that the, the, um, the money that funds the Racehorse Development Fund from March to the end of that fiscal year was, was less uh, because of the, uh, the suspension of operations at the casinos. But it sounds like from the update that you just uh, gave, is that there was an offset uh, with the re reduced number of days. And therefore, um, the track and, and, and your staff was, was able to maintain the same level of purses, it appears, uh, and even increase them in some cases, as you just, as you, as you just described. Is that a, a fair overall sort of summary of some of the dynamics uh, that we're beginning to see? Yes, and uh, we were fortunate. I, I think it's probably been mentioned at some of the other meetings. There was um, a holdover. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, there was an excess um, in the purse account at the beginning of the year, um, four hundred thousand from um, nineteen and four hundred thousand from eighteen. So there was about an eight hundred thousand um, dollar rollover from the previous years that was in the purse account, and it actually um, was very fortunate with the COVID striking that that was in there because it allowed Plain Ridge um, to keep their levels of their individual daily levels of purses up. And, um, and also that uh, our casinos were able to open um, there, uh, which obviously funds a lot of the racehorse development. Well, it does, it funds the racehorse development fund purse money. So um, other tracks in the country, if their um, casinos were uh, still shuttered, even if they were allowed to go ahead and open racing, um, their purse accounts took a big hit. So um, we were very fortunate and um, actually I, uh, a lot of horsemen really wanted to race at our track because the purses were up, um, kept up at, at decent levels, which was, was very fortunate. Thank you. Other comments or questions for Dr. Lightbaum? I just want to thank you, Dr. Lightbound, for your leadership during this um, complicated time. You worked very closely with, of course, um, uh, the um, with Director O'Toole and PPC, but you also worked closely with the community of the, the horse men and, and women, and they wanted to go to work. And uh, you know, with uh, guidelines in place, you've been able to lead. Um, a, a safe return to horse racing during this time um, without uh, incident and we're gonna you know knock on wood thank you so much for your leadership I, I sensed it when I got to visit that people were happy to be back and um, and and uh, we're pleased to be able to to do what they love the best so thank you uh, it certainly has been a challenging time thank you okay right um, I'll set them with your administrative report. Yes, okay. thank you. Uh, we can move on to item number four, uh, if that's uh, yeah, thank you. you. Okay. Yeah, thank so, you. So, um, yeah, this is on the COVID-19 developments. So right. Thank you very so much. We, I wanted to still give the uh, commission an, uh, an update on what's going on at on site at the casino, and then we'll go into the uh, executive order, uh, number 53. Well, why don't we start with the casino update so you can get a sense of what's going on presently at the casinos. And I'll turn that over to uh, Loretta and Bruce just to give you a, a sense of uh, the on site uh, activities and the COVID related issues. Thank you. I want to start with Loretta. Good morning, Loretta. Oh, Loretta, you know what? For some reason, you're you not doesn't say mute, but you might want to check your computer. Yeah, can't hear her. So Can why you just you want to just act, see if on your keyboard you accidentally muted yourself, uh, Loretta? That then otherwise we'll move on to Bruce. But we want to make sure we can restore Loretta's audio. Katrina, any ideas for her? Oh, she's seeing one. One minute. 
we're patient on this. Uh, Karen and Derek oh, and I, I already had a meeting where we had some <laughs> right. technological challenges, but it was on visual on that one. So yeah. getting the whole gamut. Yeah, I guess you have to be understanding and flexible these times. Yeah, we're okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> shifting <laughs> seats. <laughs> you are now Kate Cardigan. Uh, yeah, here you are. I'm having the pleasure of seeing Kate for the first time in many months today. So that started my day off good. And um, uh, so I'm ready to uh, proceed and we'll figure out later what's going on with, with my uh, situation. So I, Bruce and I have been updating you on the COVID related operational issues uh, at every meeting and really I don't have a lot of material updates uh, for you since the last meeting. You know, the properties have all been operating under the enhanced health and safety measures. And I, I guess it does bear repeating that all three licensees have been incredibly responsible about those measures and have taken them uh, very seriously and have put in a lot of hard work. Uh, and we're very grateful uh, for that. And the guests as well that have been visiting the properties, uh, any issues with, you know, for instance, not wearing masks properly, those have been a few and far between. So we're, we're really grateful for that as well. Uh, each property has stayed connected with its local board of health uh, and has contacts in the local board of health and the boards of health have been conducting their routine inspections at each property as well. Uh, the properties have notified us as well as the board, their boards of health, whenever they become aware of a COVID positive case in their employee uh, population. I did report to you about a month and a half ago that we received a handful uh, of notifications of COVID positives amongst the employee population across the three properties. I can update you on those notifications now. Uh, uh, to date, since the three properties opened in early July, uh, they have notified us of 20 active incidents or active employees who reported testing positive for the virus. Uh, the boards of health have also been notified in each incidence um, in the large measure of those cases, the each employee reported that they believed their exposure to the virus occurred off property, uh, usually to, from a family member, uh, in a couple of occasions from a social uh, gathering. Uh, we did not see any concerning uh, uh, pattern of multiple employees in the same division, uh, for instance. And of course, the boards of health were looking at that same information. So I did want to bring you up to date on that uh, and uh, also remind you that, you know, whenever employees are on site, they are wearing the masks and subject to uh, the health and safety measures, uh, the hygiene measures uh, as well. Um, with that said, uh, we are all mindful, as are the properties of the uptick in cases in the Commonwealth and Chair, you mentioned uh, that at the, in your opening comments, uh, both in the Commonwealth and on a, on a national uh, basis. And we are mindful of those, the properties are mindful of those, and some of those uh, trends and data are set out in the governor's uh, new order. And uh, you know, obviously the governor's order is you know, somewhat uh, the, business of the day. We've got a number of agenda items on that. So uh, you'll hear about those details uh, in the next agenda item. Um, but, uh, you know, we're mindful of those trends. The properties are mindful of those trends. We've been meeting with them all week in connection with the new order. And it's clear that they're uh, prepared to continue to put in the hard work uh, and cooperate as this uh, situation continues to evolve. Um, so really those are my prepared comments. I know Mr. Band's on the uh, call. If you have uh, anything you'd like to ask either him or me to, uh, to try to uh, provide further insight on. 
commissioners or uh, Bruce, do you want to add anything at this moment? My, my comment here kind of uh, mirror Loretta's uh, of what a, a good job the three properties are doing in uh, making sure people adhere to the, po uh, the policies uh, that they, we've set forth. They've all been doing a great job. But any comments, I, I certainly am willing to take any questions or comments. Commissioners, com Commissioner Cameron. Yes, uh, Mr. Band, um, I know we're always, we're certainly concerned about the public, but we're certainly concerned about our own employees. Now you have frontline workers, your gaming agents out there. Um, I know you did not report on any issues, but I, uh, I don't want to assume, but I suspect that, um, that they are all, uh, the plans that we have in place are keeping them safe and they are, um, you know, providing uh, and conducting their responsibilities in a way that they all feel safe and um, that, that plan has worked effectively. Yes, I, I believe so. Uh, uh, on a whole, I think we just took a survey that uh, was very positive uh, through HR. So yes, I, I believe they are. Excellent, thanks. Other questions for um, Loretta or Bruce with respect to the operations at this current state? Just again, I, I appreciate your echoing the, the licensees cooperation. I think we all, we all have appreciated that really since the guidelines were put in place. So thank you. All right. Then moving on uh, to the update with respect to the governor's executive order. Yes, as, as I'm sure everyone is aware, the uh, DPH issued a stay at home advisory uh, and also the governor issued order number 53, which had some restrictions uh, related to the COVID pa pandemic in Massachusetts and they have implications uh, for our operations. So we've been working internally and with the licensees to come up uh, with a process for you today to review how the uh, licensees are going to comply uh, with the executive order and updating our minimum requirements. So I'm going to turn it over to Loretta to review uh, what we've been doing and uh, next steps for the commission as far as um, adhering to that order in the gaming industry. So thank you, Loretta, why don't I turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Karen. So the governor's order issued on Friday afternoon uh, it uh, explicitly says that it's aiming to intervene uh, to slow the spread and does talk about uh, some of the recent uh, numbers and the role of social activity in the trend. So the order applies to casinos, live race tracks, and simulcast facilities for, for our purposes, along with a number of other entertainment venues. As Karen mentioned, it's accompanied by an advisory from the Department of Public Health uh, urging all people to stay home between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. And it's effective at 12.01 uh, this Friday. Uh, the order uh, talks about uh, the uh, properties closing no later than 9.30 p.m., reopening no earlier than 5 a.m., and that during those hours, there would be no admittance of guests or any members of the public to the premises and no services offered uh, during those hours. Uh, the order does explicitly say that employees and other workers are allowed on property during that closing period to perform duties that do not involve admitting patrons. The order also has uh, restrictions on alcohol sale and service, no alcohol sale or service during that mandatory closing period of 5 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. And the order directs the commission, uh, along with any other affected agencies, to amend or, in our case, to supplement our rules uh, so that uh, there uh, is adherence to the governor's order. So we've, uh, the next three agenda items or subparts of 4B, uh, they're broken up into uh, the casinos, the live track, and simulcasting. So I can move right into the uh, casino uh, measures. And we do have a document in your packet uh, a, uh, I think it's a three page document requirements to ensure compliance uh, with the order by the gaming establishments. Um, and that document reminds you that in June, on June 23rd, you approved minimum standards in a seven page document. That was the document that talked about, you know, in order to reopen, they had to do the pre opening cleaning and all of those. Uh, 
mass requirements, the um, communications plan, the sanitization, social distancing, plexiglass barriers, and so forth. You supplemented that initial document once already uh, when you allowed re roulette to be reintroduced. And the document in front of you today would supplement it again to incorporate the governor's order. The document in front of you today requires each of the three gaming licensees to submit a plan. Each of them has already submitted a plan and the plan uh, addresses four required areas. The first is uh, to identify the operational steps and measures that they will take to achieve compliance uh, with the governor's order in a safe and orderly manner while also continuing to comply with all of the other health and safety measures. The second area they're required to address is to uh, supplement their communications plan and their website information to inform the public of the mandatory closing period and related expectations on property around COVID-19 measures. The third requirement is that they identify steps and measures which they will take to ensure the alcohol restriction uh, are, are complied with. And the fourth uh, item specifically requires them to communicate with their uh, employees and their amenities, uh, restaurants, uh, retail, and so forth to make sure that the requirements of the governor's order are understood and complied with by all up across the property. Uh, as I mentioned, they each have submitted their plans. The plans are in the packet uh, for you. Um, I do want to remind you that although when they were built, it was intended that they would never close down, uh, they have each gone through a close down period already. Uh, so there is some uh, experience with that. And with respect to uh, Plain Ridge, they only recently resumed a 24-7 schedule. So they had been um, closing down on a, on a regular basis uh, as well. So they've had some practice. Um, the plan, which would uh, take place uh, by 9.30 this Friday night for the first mandated closure, uh, is that the gaming agent team and uh, MSP uh, GEU uh, would have an on-site present, presence uh, with the idea that any issues could be dealt with in real time and any adjustments could be made uh, going forward. I, Bruce, as you know, is on the call now. I believe Captain Connors is also on the call. The licensees are each uh, on the call. Um, so, uh, we would invite your uh, comments, questions, uh, um, any areas you want to discuss at this time. Commissioners? No questions at this time? Well, Loretta, I think that that means that the, your submissions were thorough and that the responses from the licensees were thorough. I do think um, that there are, uh, and I may be wrong because I haven't scrolled on Reddit, but there are also perhaps representatives from our licensees on today. They are. They were each invited to be here. I have looked through uh, earlier in the meeting, and I uh, believe I saw representation from each of them. So I think um, what what I would like to say is, uh, and maybe my fellow commissioners will chime in after me, is that we, we wish to thank um, the licensees for so quickly responding to the governor's um, um, request through the executive order for their cooperation. Um, I did listen to the governor's comments during the press conference, I guess it was on Monday, and he made it clear that businesses like the licensees have been doing their job, that the safeguards are working. Uh, it's just that the informal social gatherings around entertainment venues are problematic. At least that's what the data is pointing to. And so they're going to look at this sort of measured safeguard of these closings to see if it will help what looks to be a sustained surge in cases. So I think 
you know, you earlier commended the licensees for their adherence to the guidelines, both Bruce and Loretta, you articulated that so well. And I think we can say the same um, and, and, and recognize this is a hardship for our licensees to have to close at this hour. We know that the later hours are so important to their business. <clears throat> and I also think I can say it's, it is part of a, a greater good, you know, the casinos are having to be part of, of, of the puzzle here to help with respect to what <clears throat> seems to be um, the uptick. And so they are being responsible community partners and we thank them for getting these plans together so quickly. <clears throat> and I don't, I'm not hearing any questions with respect to the actual operational changes And of course, the communications plans are clear. You'll see the up, the update on the website, so patrons will be aware. Any questions with respect to the GEU efforts, Commissioner? No, I, I, well, I would just uh, look forward to your updates that have now become regular um, or periodic, or rather, um, as we enter this uh, this new phase. I think, uh, Chair, you, you articulated well that it's it's a cautious step that uh, is being imposed really on everybody, on all businesses. And and, um, and again, I look forward to uh, hearing from um, how that um, uh, goes as, as we move into it. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I, yes, I... Um, you know, I, I agree with your first statement, which was um, because we have experience with this and changes um, because of the, uh, uh, you know, the situation changes on the ground, our licensees, as well as our uh, gaming enforcement unit members, gaming agents have worked so effectively, collaboratively, and taken this extremely seriously. So I, I think the lack of questions are really because we have confidence that this will be done in an orderly manner. Um, and, and we all have experience with a changing environment, and I, I am grateful for everyone that has really worked collaboratively to keep it as safe as possible. I see, um, Captain Connors, um, you're you're now available. Any questions uh, for him as his team uh, navigates these changes as well? Yeah, Madam Madam Chair, uh, if I could just. Uh, to chime in and, and add on to what you say, obviously we're we understand the impact this is having on the livelihood of our licensees, uh, and obviously beyond that, the livelihoods of all of their incredible employees who are being impacted by these reduced hours as well. Um, you know, I, I will be interested in monitoring and kind of share this with our uh, gaming agents as well as the the GEU is to uh, look at the precautions that we're taking to that 930 hour, depending on, you know, the size of the patron, you know, the number of patrons, how we kind of conveniently, safely, effectively get everybody back onto elevators, back to their cars, and that there's, you know, we maintain social distancing and everything else that, you know, has been so important since the reopening, but understand, you know, that 930, there might be a crush of patrons who were all anxious to, to get in their last few minutes of gaming, but making sure that they're safely and effectively being um, escorted, helped to leave the property in an orderly fashion that maintains those safety protocols. Captain I, to reiterate what Commissioner Cameron said in terms of the lack of specific questions, I think it does speak to the efficiency of the working group and this commission's relationship with us and IAB in particular and their compliance. Um, the fact that we did it once before um, means that, you know, we're prepared to do it again, they're prepared to do it again. Um, and I, while well, I um, appreciate and support and um, absolutely uh, endorse the governor, you know, taking the information that he has to make the decisions that he makes, uh, I do think it's worth pointing out, um, also based on uh, Loretta's comments today in terms of the history of compliance and cases there, 
um, casinos are a necessary part of this based on the nature of what they're doing and the nature of the conduct that needs to be contained at this point. Uh, but it is not any indictment on their behavior or compliance, um, which is why I think we all have faith that the plans they've submitted and the um, confidence that IEB and GEU has that this is going to work is why you're seeing us, um, you know, ready to, to move on with this. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And, I, and, and so we commend the licensees. I, I can't see them their faces, but I, uh, again, we have been so fortunate to have your full cooperation. Captain Connors, did you want to chime in? Because I do see you just uh, um, on behalf of the GEU. Absolutely. Good morning, commissioners, Madam Chair. Good morning. Uh, just to Commissioner Stebbins point, um, obviously that is one of the, or the, the primary concern is just uh, the orderly exit of everybody in a relatively short window. Um, I, we'll, we'll monitor that, we'll report out uh, very quickly, we'll see how this weekend goes. Uh, we will have our staff obviously on on site. We'll work hand in hand with the security and uh, executive and management staff uh, to make sure that it is orderly. And you know, we'll make suggestions as needed, and we'll work, uh, you know, with the licensees and with the MGC as far as coming up with anything that we see is maybe a concern or anything along those lines. But we are confident that we can uh, get this done in an orderly fashion. And if we have to tweak it or make suggestions, uh, we will. But that line of communication is open across the board. So um, I, I feel very confident that we'll be, we'll be uh, in good shape come this weekend. But we will report back to the MGC so they know exactly what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Zinnica, you all set? Okay. Uh, excellent, excellent work. Um, uh, to uh, Loretta and to Bruce, to the entire team, and Karen for you know leading us through this. I know that Commissioner O'Brien mentioned the working team. That team's been so good at getting together on a regular basis. And as Commissioner Zuniga, we will continue to make sure that we get back to um, the commissioners on a, on a, the, the continuing um, cadence of at least you know pretty much at every one of our meetings going forward as we go through this change. If not, if we can always meet even earlier, if necessary. Okay, thanks so much. So there may be a motion associated with this agenda item. I don't know if you want to visit them all uh, at the end of section 4B, but I am asking you to officially <laughs> approve the uh, requirement so that we can officially supplement uh, your original. Yeah. Maybe it makes sense to do it now while it's fresh on the on the uh, the uh, casino guidelines, correct? Yes. So this is to, uh, of course, um, supplement the guidelines, and and I know that you've done that in consultation with uh, DPH and the governor's office, Loretta. So thank you, as required. Correct. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the commission supplement the gaming guidelines previously approved on June 23rd, 2020, by requiring each gaming licensee to re comply with the requirements to ensure compliance with COVID-19 order number 53, requiring early closing and limiting hours at the Commonwealth's gaming establishments uh, in the manner discussed today. Second. Thank you. No further discussion? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0, Shara, thank you. Okay, then moving on to item um, B2. Okay, B2 is the governor's order with respect to the live racing track. There's one live track, the harness racing track at PPC. Um, I see uh, Dr. Lightbound still on the call. I believe Mr. O'Toole is on the call as well. Um, the uh, document uh, in your packet requires PPC to supplement its protocols in a manner that incorporates the governor's order. They have already responded that they essentially are in compliance already because the hours of live racing are from 1 to 4.30 uh, Monday, Thursday, and Friday, and that the live racing patrons exit the uh, area uh, within the hour after the completion of the uh, 4.30 race, which is well before 
uh, what will be the uh, 9 p.m. closing time. And also the season uh, is scheduled to end uh, the day after Thanksgiving on November 27th. Uh, so that one is pretty straightforward. Uh, as I said, Dr. Lightbound and I think Mr. O'Toole are on the call if you have any questions for them, but similarly, I would be asking for you to formally approve the, uh, the document um, after your questions are addressed. We thank them for their immediate response as well. Any questions for um, either Loretta or Alex? Should I have a motion? Um, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission supplement its protocols for the conduct of live racing under COVID-19 to incorporate the requirements set forth in COVID-19 order number 53 in the manner discussed today. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Any discussion, questions? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes, five zero. Thank you. Moving then on to fourth um, B3, please. Okay, and that item uh, involves the simulcast facilities and the in compliance with the governor's order. And the document in your packet requires each of the three simulcast facilities to submit in writing uh, their plan explaining how they will abide. Uh, they have all done so already. Um, uh, Raynham has uh, indicated that they intend to close on or before 9.30 p.m. And I understand from Dr. Lightbaum that they are already in the process of starting to inform their patrons um, of, of the new uh, closing time. Uh, Suffolk Downs has indicated in writing that they are not open past 8 p.m. Uh, anyway. Um, and will not be opening uh, before the uh, 10 a.m. hour. And PPC has already uh, responded and has implemented a limited hours uh, Sunday through Thursday from noon to 8 and Friday and Saturday from noon to 9 p.m. So um, uh, similarly, I, I believe those uh, facilities are on the call. If you had anything specific them. We did get uh, prompt responses uh, from them that are in your packet, uh, and I uh, would be asking you to adopt uh, uh, the document as well for the simulcast. Any questions on the simulcasting? Again, thank you uh, to, to those involved for getting back to Loretta and team so quickly and comprehensively. Do I have a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission direct the simulcasting licensees to supplement their respective plans for re reopening of simulcast facilities as discussed today to ensure compliance with COVID-19 order number 53 and to submit that plan to the commission for approval. Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you, Shara. So uh, thank you so much for the uh, comprehensive report. I feel like uh, we've accomplished the goal today on that matter. So we can move on then to item number five. Loretta, are you all set? I am all set on that item as well. And uh, this item involves the request that MGM submitted for an amendment to their uh, gaming beverage license. There is a one page memo in your uh, packet specifically. Uh, MGM is asking for what they have termed a smart bar service bar uh, to be located in a secure uh, area. Uh, they have explained that uh, they uh, want this bar, feel they need this bar uh, during the period where we have these uh, COVID uh, measures because all patrons, uh, when uh, getting anything to drink now, whether it's an alcoholic beverage, non-alcoholic beverage, 
uh, the, the servers are required to bring them the drink. There's no self-service and patrons are not allowed to go up to a bar uh, and uh, place an order uh, themselves. Uh, so this uh, service bar uh, would uh, increase service times and also reduce uh, some of the, um, uh, or enhance some of the distancing measures uh, for the cocktail servers. Uh, our IB team, in particular, Andrew Steffen, a senior supervisor, has uh, conducted an inspection with an eye towards the restricted aspect, uh, re restricted as access aspect of the bar and the surveillance coverage of the bar. Uh, he's on the call. I would invite him to uh, uh, tell you uh, what his uh, inspection showed. Uh, and uh, Mr. Miller and Mr. Barry from MGM are also on the call if you had any particular uh, questions for them. So if I can turn it over to, uh, to Andrew, that'd be great. Good morning, you, Andrew. Madam. Hey, good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, I'll make this very brief. Uh, last week, our IEB team at MGM Springfield inspected the proposed smart bar in the former promotions area. Uh, first, with regards to its security measures, the service bar is located behind a locked door accessible only by an RFID swipe or proxy card, similar to a card that you would use to access the building. Uh, once at the service bar, the system itself is only accessible by a point of sale or POS swipe card held only by MGM beverage staff members. Uh, the bar has a locking storage cabinet in the lower section, uh, which can be secured when not in operation. Again, only MGM beverage staff will have access to this physical key uh, lastly, we have also verified the adequacy of the surveillance coverage in that area for which the IEB does approve for MGM to conduct their proposed operations. Um, with regards to the actual operation of the unit, uh, as this is referred to as a smart bar, the system dispenses mixed drinks only. Beer and wine will not be available from this service bar. Um, to utilize it, a beverage staff member will swipe their POS swipe card, select the correct mixed drink, and the system will auto dispense the beverage there is no real bartender or actual pouring of drinks. Um, so to close, the IEB does approve for the use of the one smart bar as proposed by MGM Springfield. Um, those are the only prepared comments I have um, on the smart bar. I'd be happy to take any questions you may have or go back to a minute. Commissioners, Commissioner Zinnica. Yeah, just a question for Loretta. Remind us, uh, Loretta, this, um, we have, have been in present for some time now in Angkor. Um, if I remember correctly, we had a discussion about this a while ago. Um, is this the first one at MGM or have there been others? Just for context. So you're, uh, you're right, Commissioner. Uh, there are some units, similar uh, units, uh, that serve the same function that you approved uh, for Angkor. Uh, this is the first uh, such amendment at MGM. Okay. Thank you. Uh, MGM has indicated that it's a uh, COVID-related request. Uh, unlike Encore, they would not expect to continue uh, with this item, uh, you know, when we are finally in the day uh, that we can return to, you know, normal uh, operations. Look forward to that time too. We all do, yes. Other other questions for Andrew or Loretta? Bruce? I have just one question. Uh, it's probably um, not an issue, uh, and I'm sure you gave it thought, Andrew, but it looks like it's in a rather confined space. The um, servers are, who go there are able to maintain um, their social distance if they, if they have two, or is it pretty much only going to be one server who goes up to mix the drinks? The way it was explained to me, it'd only be one server um, that would okay. utilize the bar at one time. However, there is space in that area should another server enter um, in that area. There's space where the server can keep their distance as well. Okay, thank you. And again, um, later on, it would probably make sense that when it is busy that that space wouldn't work. So I understand. That's great. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you. And, okay. So we do need to take action on that as well, correct, Loretta? That's right. The um, regulations uh, uh, require a recommendation, and we do recommend that you approve this, but uh, we require 
uh, your vote to approve. So, uh, Madam Chair, I would move that uh, the Commission approve MGM Springfield's request to amend the alcoholic beverage license to add a new license area for a smart bar or a service bar as discussed here today. Second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, no further questions or comments. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stephens. Aye. And I vote yes, thank you. Moving on then to item 5B on the, thank you so much, Andrew, nice to see you. Um, and uh, on the, uh, on the employment exemptions, thank you. Maybe Andrew will be back. There we go, Commissioner. Hi, Derek, good morning again. Good morning, how are you? Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'm joined by Mary Polgren, Acting Supervisor of Employee Licensing, and Lisa Bruckner, Acting Supervisor of Vendor Licensing, and we're here to request uh, service employee registrations exemptions for both MGM and MGM Springfield and Encore Boston Harbor. In your package, you have two memorandums. Uh, the first is a request from Wahlburgers, a vendor of MGM Springfield, which is located within the gaming facility. Uh, but due to the layout of the MGM facility, the Wahlburgers restaurant is not connected to the gaming floor at all. The five positions being requested for exemption are consistent with other positions exempted at MGM, both um, for their employees as well as for vendors of the employee of the um, establishment. The second request is for a position at Encore Boston Harbor. It's a new position titled Security Ambassador. And the main responsibilities of the position are welcoming guests to Encore Boston Harbor, distributing masks and hand sanitizer, as well as monitoring thermal imaging equipment and temperature scan, uh, scanners. Through multiple discussions with the uh, EBH team, we have verified that even though the position reports to the security team, they will not have access to gaming systems, player data, or secure areas of the back of the house without an escort. Um, the licensing team is in agreement with these requests and has asked the commission for consideration. If you have any questions, our team is here is available to answer. Commissioner Seneca. You know, just to, um, to emphasize um, what, um, perhaps what Derek alluded to, uh, that um, this would be very much in my read um, in, in line with prior exemptions we've done in the past. There is um, very little connection to the gaming floor. And, um, I have also been uh, personally on the side of exemptions because those tend to provide more opportunities to um, uh, groups that sometimes are um, uh, shut out of opportunities for employment. So um, uh, I'll go along with the recommendation and I thank you for that update. Other questions or comments for Derek and team? Um, Just, it was nice to see Lisa. Good morning. Uh, Madam Chair, just one question uh, as so it relates to the EBH facilities. Um, Mr. Lennon, do you know if those uh, security ambassadors are going to be on the gaming floor? Or are they meant to be in more of the public areas of the gaming facility? So the, <clears throat> this is part of the conversations we had. It's mainly by the hotel entrance. Um, which is where they'll be, where the security ambassadors will be. Um, not on the gaming floor. If they were to be asked to do a little bit, and this would really only be for staffing issues, of right by the gaming floor where they enter, they may do that. But the intent of the position is at the hotel entrance. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Just, Derek, to put a finer point on that, the job description says no work on the gaming floor. So they may be near the gaming floor, but I say I take it you, that's still that's a that's a no to that question on the form. Correct. That's a no. Not actual floor. Okay. No. And we had to have multiple conversations with that because when you see a position reporting to security, um, and actually, it, this is a good 
area where Loretta had asked the IEB to review this, um, it, it, it brought up a few extra questions just to that point. How, how aren't they gonna have access to these areas when it's reporting to security? Um, but we did get verification. There will not be access, not on the gaming floor. And this is really an ambassador just to make sure masks are being worn, temperatures are correct, and hand sanitizers available. These are new positions created in response to the pandemic. Correct. And so they're going to really limit their role. Correct. Any further I, uh, questions? Yeah, Madam Chair, just a just a comment. I find all of these requests uh, reasonable, reasonable, and um, in in keeping with what we've done in the past. And uh, I appreciate the uh, thoroughness of the team in asking those additional questions to make sure we are um, comfortable and consistent. I have to ask the follow-up question. You know, this is an exciting opportunity for new positions at Wahlburgers. You know, really. Um, supporting uh, what was envisioned, of course, without the complexity of a pandemic, um, uh, being the economic driver and job creator. So we um, we want to uh, commend Wahlburgers, and this is an opportunity for, for jobs. So um, I guess I'm wondering if we know, do we have an idea as to when the doors will be open? Not yet? So we still do not have a date okay. um, for when the doors will be open. And I think the latest executive order has um, caused sense. some reconsideration for even what they may have had for a, for a sensitive soft opening. I understand, but the, at least they're lining up the idea that these jobs will be put in place. So uh, that's exciting. Right. Uh, excellent. Do we have any further questions? Uh, just to, to that point, Madam Chair, obviously mm -hmm. us um, looks like granting those exemptions will then kind of help direct uh, Wahlburgers uh, as they go through and screen and recruit candidates for these jobs. So this is a, an important first step. Okay. Uh, can we uh, do a single vote on this or do we have motions? I'm prepared to make a motion on all of them. Um, okay, assuming thank you. that there seems to be consensus around it. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll move that the Commission exempt the following positions from registration requirements uh, for the reasons described here today. Number one, the Wahlburgers line and prep cook. Number two, the Wahlburgers dishwasher. Number three, the Wahlburgers hostess. Number four, the Wahlburgers dining room attendant. Number five, the Wahlburgers cashier. And number six, the Anchor temporary security ambassador. Second. Thank you. Any further questions on those positions? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stevens. Aye. I vote yes. Five zero. Shar, thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to um, Lisa, Mary, and the IB team for all their work on these. And we actually have Lisa and Mary joining us, so thank you. Um, it's nice to see your faces. We all miss, miss seeing you regularly. Thank you. Moving on then to item number six on our agenda, uh, back to uh, Loretta for um, IEP Matters and Kate. Thank you. And I, can you hear me now? I think you can hear me now. We All can. right, I, well, I figured it out uh, <laughs> and just in time to turn over this agenda item to, uh, to Kate. Good Excellent. Good morning. Nice to see you all. Um, and I have uh, several items for consideration today. We have two corporate qualifiers for consideration, uh, David Williams and Christopher Soriano. And after that, I'll move on to five entity qualifiers uh, for, um, for Boston Harbor. So beginning with... Uh, the two corporate qualifiers. These are both qualifiers for Penn National Gaming, Inc. Uh, Penn National Gaming is the parent company of the Massachusetts Category 2 casino licensee, Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment, LLC. Um, each of these individuals submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. The IEB conducted its usual complete protocol for suitability 
for casino qualifiers and we confirmed financial stability and integrity, reviewed litigation history, searched criminal history, verified that no prohibitive political contributions were made in Massachusetts, and also conducted checks of open source material and law enforcement databases as part of the investigation. The team uh, for the investigation into Mr. Williams consisted of Trooper Thomas Roger of the Gaming Enforcement Unit and uh, Director of Financial Investigations Monica Chang. Uh, the team for Mr. Soriano consisted of, again, Trooper Roger and uh, Financial Investigator Zonfei Zhu. And uh, I am very fortunate to have the members of the teams joining in on the call today uh, in case there are any questions from commissioners after presentation. Uh, IEB investigators were also able to interview each of these candidates via teleconference. Mr. Williams was interviewed on August 25th of 2020 and Mr. Soriano on September 9th of 2020. I know that both parties were cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of the investigations. Turning first to Mr. Williams, he joined PNGI in January of 2020, first as an executive advisor before taking over as chief financial officer in March of 2020. Mr. Williams' responsibilities as CFO include oversight of all Penn's corporate financial functions. Mr. Williams reports directly to Jay Snowden, who's the chief executive officer of Penn National Gaming. Mr. Williams is based out of Penn's corporate headquarters in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. Uh, prior to his position, current position with Penn National Gaming, uh, he worked from September of 1990 to May of 1995 at First Franklin Financial, where he was a financial planning and analysis manager. Uh, he then took a position at Claris International as CFO. That was from May of 1995 to October of 2019. Uh, and then uh, joined Penn National Gaming again, first as an executive advisor in January of 2020, and then in his current position um, as executive vice president and CFO beginning in March of 2020. Uh, Mr. Williams, as part of his employment, has submitted gaming license applications in numerous jurisdictions where Penn National conducts business. Uh, several of these are currently pending. Uh, however, he has subsequently been approved by uh, gaming uh, regulators in Texas, West Virginia, Colorado, and Ohio. Our background review confirmed that Mr. Williams completed his undergraduate studies at San Jose State University and graduated in 1990 with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Mr. Williams has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable. And at this time, the IEB recommends the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for PMGI. Any questions uh, with regard to Mr. Williams? Okay. Uh, I will uh, note that Ms. Bedard has uh, prepared the motions and uh, because Mr. Soriano and Mr. Williams are both qualifiers for the same um, licensee, I will present the vote uh, together for those two parties. So I'll move on to the presentation of Mr. Soriano. Christopher Soriano currently serves as Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer for PNGI. He attended George Washington University and graduated in 2000 with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. Mr. Soriano then continued his studies at Temple University Law School, graduated in 2003 with a Juris Doctorate. At PNGI, his main responsibilities as uh, the Chief Compliance Officer are to oversee Penn's regulatory and legal obligations. Mr. Soriano is also based at Penn National Gaming Corporate Headquarters in Wyoming, Pennsylvania. He reports directly to Carl Sodosanti, who is the Executive Vice President and General Counsel for Penn. Prior to joining PNGI in February of 2020, Mr. Soriano worked previously from September 2003 to April of 2009 at Wolf Block LLP, where he was an associate. He then moved to Dwayne Morris, where he was an associate, special counsel, and partner from April of 2009 to February of uh, 2020. And he also, uh, at the same time, held an adjunct professorship professorship at Seton Hall University. Uh, he began that in January of 2019 and currently retains that position in addition to his current role at Penn, which he took in February of 2020. Mr. Soriano has also submitted gaming licenses to numerous uh, jurisdictions. Uh, and most recently, he was found suitable by the New Mexico Game and Control Board. That was in October of 2020. Mr. Soriano has also demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable. And the IEB recommends the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for Penn National Game. Any questions with regard to Mr. Soriano? No, I, I, I do want to note that Mr. Soriano has joined us today. Um, 
If you haven't noticed, I, I see him. Thank you so much for joining us today. Any questions for Kate? Th th Mr. Soran, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, no, just a quick note. Uh, I'm a fellow colonial like Mr. Soriano, but we did not attend GW at the same time. Commissioner, I hope the basketball program uh, has improved uh, since the times that both of us were there. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, both investigation reports were clean and comprehensive. There, there are no issues at all um, with these investigations. So. Uh, I'd be happy to make a motion. Yes, I guess I would just note that I did um, appreciate the thoroughness of the reports as always. I want to thank um, uh, Trooper Roger and uh, of course Monica and, um, and Zongfei Zhu for their work uh, in, in the thoroughness of the report so we can move on these matters. Uh, thank you Mr. Soriano for today. I, uh, we appreciate your, your uh, arriving as, as part of our meeting. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, yes, uh, I move that the commission issue positive determinations of suitability to the following two individual qualifiers um, for Plain Ridge Park Casino. Christopher Soriano, uh, Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer for Penn National Gaming, Inc. David Williams, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Penn National Gaming, Inc. Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Any, any comments, questions? Okay. okay, then we'll move ahead on our vote. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Commissioner Steppens. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you so much. Excellent work, Kate. Uh, we appreciate the thoroughness. My thanks to the investigative team on both of those individuals. Excellent work. Yeah. And, and uh, and thank you, Mr. Soriano, we wish you well. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. All right, uh, next I can move on to the five entity qualifiers uh, that uh, will be presented today. Uh, these are five entity qualifiers attached to Encore Boston Harbor. Um, I'll list them first and then we'll go into um, an explanation of how they're connected. Um, and uh, again, ask for a vote at the conclusion uh, regarding all five. Um, so these are entity qualifiers, EBH Mass Property LLC, EBH Holdings LLC, Win America Group LLC, Win Resorts Finance LLC, and Win Resorts Holdings LLC. I'll give again a brief um, oral explanation of how they're connected to the licensee in Massachusetts. I would note that um, there's a very helpful chart at page three um, of the reports that were submitted uh, prior to this meeting or your review if you find that at all helpful. Uh, to keep track of um, things as we progress through the report. Um, as the commissioners know, WinMass LLC is the, is the category one licensee in Massachusetts. It's the parent company of two of these mm -hmm. qualifiers for consideration, EBH Holdings LLC and EBH Mass Property LLC. Uh, Win Mass LLC is a subsidiary of Win America Group LLC. Win America Group is a new holding company of all of Wynn's North American properties, including Wynn Mass LLC. Uh, Wynn America Group LLC serves essentially as a pass-through to uh, another one of these entities for your consideration, Wynn Resorts Finance LLC. And Wynn Resorts Finance LLC is a holding company in turn for Wynn America Group LLC. Uh, Wynn Resorts Finance LLC is in turn a subsidiary of Wynn Resorts Holdings LLC, uh, which holds ownership interest in Wynn's intellectual properties. So with that brief explanation, if there are no questions, uh, I will move into a uh, more detailed explanation of um, the first entity, EBH Mass Property LLC. Uh, EBH Mass Property LLC was organized in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, March 29th of 2019. Uh, the business purpose of this entity is a real estate holding entity of Wynn Mass LLC's physical assets. The entity has no employees and the officers and directors are all individuals who have already been found suitable by the commission. Uh, the company is owned by WinMass LLC at 99% and EBH Holdings LLC at 1%. Uh, the following individuals are qualifiers in good standing, as I mentioned, associated with EBH Mass Properties LLC, and these are Matthew Maddox, Allison Rankin, Jackie Crum, and Brian Goldbrands. Again, all have had positive determinations of suitability um, 
or have been reviewed as key gaming executive uh, employees by the commission previously. Um, the, are there any questions regarding uh, the first entity of the five before I move on? Okay, uh, moving on, the second entity for consideration is EBH Holdings, LLC. This is a legal entity registered and organized in the state of Nevada. Uh, it was organized March 18th of 2019 and it operates as a holding company. Uh, EBH Holdings LLC has no employees or subcontractors for consideration, and it also has individual qualifiers associated with it who have been uh, found previously suitable. And th these would include mathematics, cred billings, uh, Ellen Whittemore as well. And again, uh, these individuals have been deemed suitable as qualifiers for WinMass LLC. All are currently in good standing. Any questions with regard to EBH Holdings? Okay, moving on to the third entity qualifier. This is Win America Group LLC. This is a legal entity registered and organized again in the state of Nevada in September of 2019. Uh, Win America Group LLC operates as a holding company for Win Resorts Limited's domestic operating subsidiaries, and these include Win Mass LLC, the Massachusetts licensee. This entity also has no employees, and the officers and directors are all individuals who have already been found suitable by the commission. Uh, the company is owned by Win Resorts Finance LLC at 100%. Uh, the individual qualifiers all in good standing associated with this entity are Craig Billings and Ellen Whittemore. Any questions with regard to the third entity? Okay, moving on to Wynn Resorts Finance LLC. Uh, this is a legal entity registered, again, and uh, organized in the state of Nevada, September of 2014. It operates as a holding company. It has no employees, and the officers and directors are all individuals who have already been found suitable by the commission. It is owned at 100% by Wynn Resorts Holdings, and the individual qualifiers in good standing are Craig Billings and Ellen Whittemore. And moving on to the fifth and final entity, this is Wynn Resorts Holdings, LLC. Uh, this is a legal entity registered in the state of Nevada in May of 2000. It operates as a holding company uh, for all of the company's intellectual property portfolio. Um, the entity has no employees. Uh, the officers and directors, again, are all individuals who have already been found suitable uh, by the commission. This company is also owned 100% by Wynn Resorts Limited. And uh, Ellen Whittemore is the qualifier in good standing uh, with respect to this particular entity. Uh, moving on to the financial analysis that was um, completed with regard to these five entities, um, the financial team did its uh, usual thorough analysis. They did conduct a financial in, um, evaluation of these five entities with regard to their connection to Wynn Mass LLC. Uh, to do this, they reviewed audited financial statements of Wynn Resorts Limited. They also reviewed unaudited and internally compiled statements where appropriate and did confirm that there were no areas of concern regarding the financial uh, integrity of these five entities. Any questions with regard to the financial review? And I do note that uh, Ms. Chang and her team are on the call should there be any particular questions. Moving on to gaming licensure, as the commissioners made be aware of these enti are entity qualifiers who do not hold gaming licenses in other jurisdictions. Um, they have not previously been through the qualification process. Um, and I would note, however, that Wynn Resorts Limited licenses in Nevada and Macau are in good standing. Um, and in terms of compliance or regulatory history, these are all fairly new um, entities. They do not have independent compliance committees or independent audit committees. However, uh, there are standard reporting um, requirements under the Wynn Resorts Limited Compliance Program uh, and also under the uh, Wynn Resorts Limited Audit Committee rules. So if there had been any activity that met these reporting requirements, it would be reported up through those two bodies rather than individual committees within the entities. Regarding uh, criminal history, these five entities have no criminal history to speak of. The same goes for the uh, research into any civil litigation, no civil litigation involving these entity qualifiers exists which would impact a suitability determination. Um, and the investigative team notes no significant issues or concerns regarding any of these five entities. In conclusion, uh, based upon review of the submitted applications, supplemental materials, and independent analysis, the IEB finds no reason why these newly formed entities should not be deemed suitable by the commission, and therefore recommends the commission make a positive finding of suitability for each of these five entities. Thank you. Any questions for Kate on 
both her thorough presentation and the report. I guess again, that that is an indicator that it's well done. So our silence um, speaks volumes on that front, Kate. I, I think have to thank uh, Lieutenant Banks, part of my interruption. I neglected to mention Lieutenant Banks and uh, Paul Eldridge of the FI team were the investigative team uh, with regard to all five of these entities and, and excellent work as well. Excellent, thank you. Okay, uh, no questions. Um, do I have a motion with respect to these entities? I, um, Madam Chair, you, sure. I move that the commission issue positive determinations of suitability to the following five entity qualifiers for Encore Boston Harbor. Uh, number one, EBH Mass Property LLC. Two, EBH Holdings LLC. Three, Win America Group LLC. Four, Win Resorts Finance LLC, and five, Win Resorts Holdings LLC. Second. Thank you. No questions. Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you. Five zero. Excellent work. Very much appreciated. It's so nice to see you, Kate. Thank you. Likewise. Take care. Oh, and there's Monica. Thank you so much, Monica. All right, then we're going to move on to item number seven on our agenda. Um, Community Affairs Division. We have um, Community Affairs Division Chief Delaney. Good morning. There you are. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Um, so today um, in front of you, we have a uh, we issued a non-transportation planning grant back in 2019, uh, a joint non-transportation planning grant to the towns of Foxborough, Plainville, and Rentham for in the amount of $75,000. And that those funds were used to hire a marketing consultant to prepare a strategic uh, marketing plan for the region and specifically <clears throat> excuse me, for, for the Plainridge Park Casino, uh, Gillette Stadium, Patriot Place, and the Rentham um, outlets. And uh, in that work that was done, um, it came in at uh, significantly below the originally estimated cost. Um, so it was only $47,800, which leaves an unexpended balance of $27,200. So the uh, communities have asked um, if they could repurpose those funds to uh, do the development of a web, a web page that would, uh, a website, I should say, uh, you know, to promote those uh, particular uh, things, Plainridge Park, uh, Patriot Place, rent them outlets, and the communities themselves. And um, so we got a, a draft uh, request for proposals from the communities, and we took a look at that and made some comments on it. Uh, but it looks it looks great. Um, this is not uh, this is similar to what we did with Northampton, where they developed a website to try to uh, you know. Uh, leverage the, the 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 folks that come to the casino to to come see some of the other things in the area um, so we think this is a great use for this money and uh, we recommend that um that the commission approve that um, the reason that we had to come back to the commission is that it's more than 10 percent of the uh, value of the grant so to repurpose that we need a vote from the commission Thank you. Questions for uh, Joe or Mary, who I see. Good morning, Mary. Sure, Madam Chair. Um, more just to comment um, and thanks, Joe, for your, your good work and following up with the folks down there on, on this kind of additional request. You know, I, I, I think we need to, you know, just commend the folks in Foxborough and Plainville and Rentham, uh, Paige and Jennifer and the team in Rentham for trying to be uh, so creative and think outside the box. Um, this is the use, I believe, Joe, of Foxborough's reserves. So uh, again, just speaks to the, the regional cooperation that those communities are having and trying to uh, position their community, which includes Plain Ridge uh, Park, uh, as, uh, as a visitor destination. So um, I, I commend their work, I commend this effort, and uh, you know, hopefully at some point they can come back and uh, uh, 
show the uh, the good work that they were able to do with this kind of supplemental or reallocation of funds. But uh, certainly encouraged by their work and uh, and appreciate all their good efforts. Further questions, Commissioner Kim? Yeah, no question. But I I concur with uh, Commissioner Stebbins and. Um, I've always loved this project, you know, working collaboratively to really highlight the area and the um, fabulous amenities there are in the, in the collective area. So I think uh, I agree that this is a great use of uh, those funds. Uh, uh, Commissioner Zuniga, can you also? Yeah, I, I, I um, echo the comments that I, I am reminded that you may be putting together some kind of a brown bag training, and this is an example of a great regional um, effort of a certain scale that, that might be really helpful for other prospective applicants. Uh, this is, doesn't impact my vote whatsoever, but I'm just curious. When they did the strategic marketing plan, was the development of a website, a joint website, part of uh, uh, the, the plan's outcome, if you happen to know? No, I don't think it was initially. It was, you know, they wanted to come up with this with this plan, and I think as part of that, the, you know, developing a website was sort of the next logical step of that of that um, project. Yeah, well, it does work together nicely. So, uh, <clears throat> just curious. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. I'd also, add, I know in a, a at a future meeting, we're going to be looking at uh, Plain Ridge Parks tourism new tourism plan uh and i believe this this partnership uh at least in the early drafts is is mentioned uh prominently good so inform that that's excellent it's good to see it at work and it's also good to come out under budget don't you think yeah <laughs> <laughs> i see commissioner Zunica. that was what i was waiting for i thought commissioner Zunica was going to comment on that um that uh, it, it's nice to see that they accomplished what they wanted with um, less dollars. Uh, so excellent. All righty. Um, we have to have a motion then, I believe, uh, for this, a 10% piece. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the commission allow for the amendment of the joint 2019 non-transportation grant instrument to reflect that the balance of $27,200 can be used for the development of website slash brand design services, highlighting the connection of the casino with the towns of Foxborough, Plainville, and London. Second. Any further comments? Excellent. Thank you, Mary. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Yes, five zero. Thank you, Shara. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Joe and Mary. It's always great to Thank see you. you. Alrighty, moving on now back to Dr. Lightbound on um, an important uh, uh, discussion on the application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the racing, com the uh, gaming commission received one application to conduct live racing in Massachusetts for 2021 from Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment uh, Plain Ridge Race Course. On 11-3 um, uh, earlier this week, the commission held an open um, meeting and hearing on the license to get input. Um, no one spoke against the license and uh, several of the town officials shared their good relationship that they have with uh, Plain Ridge. Um, I would like to echo that. Um, this year has been uh, particularly interesting. Um, Steve O'Toole and I have opened um, the racetrack uh, multiple years before, kind of have a pattern down. Um, we had actually come to the commission with several of our opening um, ish ideas and um, uh, items um, right before the COVID uh, shutdown. Um, obviously, that created a whole new uh, dynamic. Um, Steve was uh, very uh, good to work with and his staff um, about trying to come up with the protocols um, and then implementing them. Um, I also want to thank Chris Mackerlane, who's the Vice President of Racing for Penn National. Um, Chris uh, oversees multiple tracks for Penn National, including Plain Ridge, and um, he ended up uh, being responsible for helping um, come up with the plan with the horseman and I. 
um, his uh, steady hand and his input on what was uh, going on with some of the other tracks um, was very helpful. And um, I really did appreciate uh, getting to know Chris better and um, his help with that matter. Um, again, uh, once we came up with the COVID plans, it's a whole other thing to implement them. And not just uh, the um, plans themselves, but how to incorporate that with the regulation of racing. Um, it ended up that we, in order to uh, keep the um, social distancing, we basically had to use the entire backside as the paddock, which included um, having to retrofit the stalls. Um, and I want to commend the horsemen. Um, they were very helpful in jumping right in, um, providing things like gates, um, snaps, different things that um, help Steve and his crew get that um, transition up and running fast. Um, as you know, uh, it's, the jobs were impacted by the um, COVID and with the horsemen, it's not only their income that is affected, but, <clears throat> and their ability to pay their own personal bills, but they also still have to feed their horses. So, um, these were very trying times for them and, um, they pulled through and, um, really helped get the meet up and running, um, so that we could get the purse money out to everybody. So I want to commend the uh, whole racing community, as well as our staff who um, got very involved in making this all work. <clears throat> um, with that, I'll go on to um, the application. Um, there are several criteria that are outlined in Chapter 128A, Section 3.1, um, and the Commission can, of course, uh, consider other uh, items as, as well. Uh, quickly, those criteria are the financial ability of the applicant to operate a racetrack, uh, the maximization of state revenues, the suitability of the racing facility for operations at the time of the year for which the dates are assigned, that large groups of spectators require safe and convenient facilities, having and maintaining proper physical facilities for racing meetings, and according fair treatment to the economic interest and investments of those who in good faith have provided and maintained the facilities. Um, Plain Ridge um, meets all of these criteria. Um, they are the only facility to apply for a harness race meeting this year. Um, previously, they've met the requirements of um, the gaming statute on the number of days that they need to race. Um, now, um, it's the Gaming Commission can um, work with them on the number of days they want, and they have a uh, seven-year agreement with the Harness Horsemen of New England's Association um, to run 100 day, 110 days of racing each year, so that's what they have applied to. Um, that also completes, will complete their requirements for um, the simulcasting requirements of 128C. Um, so uh, my recommendation and the racing division's recommendation is to um, grant these the license. Uh, something we've done for the last uh, six years is uh, have a condition that they have an independent expert review the track surface prior to racing. Um, this is not done because there was any perceived issue with the track, but it was um, something that we began doing with um, Suffolk Downs. Um, and so uh, the commission felt that we uh, could, you know, go ahead and do this with um, Pine Ridge as well. And um, it never hurts to have a second set of eyes on your racetrack. So this has gone um, very smoothly in the past. Um, Steve O'Toole is on the line if there's any questions. Questions for Dr. Lightbound or Director O'Toole? Um, Madam Chair, not a question necessarily because we we um, you know, we heard from um, community members, uh, town officials who are very enthusiastic about um, about this racing license and um, the track in particular in in the, in the town, um, and uh, we did get a chance to hear a little bit from Mr. O'Toole at that hearing uh, and. Uh, he satisfactorily um, uh, really responded to, to and, and explained everything about this upcoming season in a very comprehensive man uh, manner. I would like to thank Mr. O'Toole and Dr. Lightbaum, though, because they really did have to work 
extremely hard this year in a, in a, in a trying year. And, and the horsemen and women, uh, everyone really collaborated effectively to keep it safe. And, you know, there have been some issues around the country with tracks, but we were able to keep our racing meets safe. And uh, it certainly gives me confidence that next year um, they will be able to do the same, no matter what the circumstances. For the comments, I would just reiterate what I said at the hearing is that we not only had comments uh, this past week that were so enthusiastic about the horse racing program, but also as part of um, consideration in our relicensure process, the uh, public comments there were um, multitudes were really focused on the horse racing, which I really hadn't anticipated and I'm so pleased that they were so enthusiastic and uh, really value the partnership with, with um, Penn National and PPC. So thank you. And again, just what I said earlier, uh, Dr. Lightbound, um, your leadership here during these trying times has been tremendous for you, your team, and for the entire horse racing community. So thank you. Thank you. So this is a, a, a vote now on the application that we need. There are no further questions. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, you're all set for Dr. Lightbound? I'm all set, thank you. Okay, and Commissioner Zunica? Okay, and Commissioner Stebbins? And this is our single application. We need a, a motion, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, having conducted a public hearing on November 3rd, 2020, to review the Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment LLC application to hold or conduct a live racing meeting in 2021 as included in the packet. And having considered the factors outlined in section 3I of chapter 128A of the, of the general laws, I move that the commission award a racing meeting license to Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment LLC for racing meetings located at Plain Ridge Park Casino for 110 days during the 2021 racing season. Second. I would only add that I don't believe we had a single negative comment um, with respect to the relicensure um, or with respect to uh, this um, application. Uh, that's just a tremendous, it, but a lot of input. This is a very important part of the, the um, community in Plainville and for uh, the towns, the surrounding towns. So thank you. I just wanted to make sure I was clear on that. Okay, we'll take a vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes. Thank you. And congratulations. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Moving on then to item number nine on our um, agenda. Does, uh, before we get started, does anybody need a brief break? I'm not seeing any thumbs up yet. So should we continue? Yes? Okay. Yes. Then moving on to item number nine, um, Executive Director Wells, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the Commission. So I have come before you before and given you uh, some uh, outlines of what we've been doing with respect to compliance within the agency, but this would be a good time to just uh, have a, another conversation about that. Uh, I know you've been briefed in writing in detail on some of our compliance activities, uh, but it would be helpful today if I go through all of these um, to uh, allow for an opportunity to discuss the internal audit and compliance committee. We have uh, Commissioners Amiga and Commissioner O'Brien uh, have been working with that, but it gives the other commissioners an opportunity to ask questions and, and be briefed more fully on that. And also just an opportunity to have a discussion and get some feedback uh, from all of you on the structure of compliance at the agency or any thoughts uh, you have going forward as we, as we look at this. Compliance is a really important uh, part of our function uh, as a regulatory agency. And we have both external and internal compliance functions. We're looking at other entities and our licensees, but we're also looking at ourselves. So uh, I am definitely open to any feedback or any suggestions or any improvements that we can have uh, on our own operations and how we ensure compliance by our licensees. So Shara has uh, 
uh, agreed to help me out here and, and share the screen. We have a, a brief PowerPoint just to help me walk through some of these uh, areas. Thanks, Shara. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Okay, so as I stated, we engage in compliance activities which uh, focus not only on our casino licensees, but only and also on our own internal operations. And I could compartmentalize into three groups. Uh, we have to ensure on-site compliance by our casino licensees at the gaming establishments. That is a very public function that we have. These casinos are, are large properties in the Commonwealth. There's a lot of attention. And that is a core mission uh, for our agency by statute to ensure compliance and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, we also have compliance with community and commission requirements. There are external requirements by the state, by the commission, by, um, by local communities, and in enforcing those is part of our job. So I uh, wanted to give you a briefing on how that's working. And also we have our own internal MGC compliance activities. We do hold our casinos and our other licensees to high standards, and it makes sense to hold ourselves to those high standards as well and do the right thing with our own operations to preserve our own integrity as we complete our uh, statutorily mandated mission. So if we can go to the next one, please, Shara, thanks. So ensuring on-site compliance by the casino licensees at these gaming establishments uh, takes a multi-pronged approach. Uh, one of the most uh, notable, obviously, is the 24-7 on-site compliance that we have through our Investigations and Enforcement Bureau Gaming Agents Division. We have approximately 33 full-time employees uh, that uh, serve on all three properties. And a, a big part of their job is um, that casinos are required to submit an, an and obtain MGC approval for their internal controls and how they operate in related departments. And that includes surveillance, cage, table game slots, etc. And the gaming and agents division, they review the original submissions, requests for changes, which must be, and those all must be approved by the executive director. And then what happens on site is the gaming agents uh, who are on site, they ensure compliance with those internal controls and those related standard operating procedures. Um, if there is an issue at the property, we have a whole protocol. Um, if there are identified instances of non-compliance with internal controls, uh, the division can ensure, uh, issue an informal oral warning or a written notice of non-compliance. If there are more serious or repeated incidents of non-compliance, the division in conjunction with the Chief Enforcement Council may issue a formal notice of non-compliance followed, uh, if warranted and upon authorization by the director of the IEB, a civil administrative penalty. Uh, the casino may negotiate an agreed, agreed upon resolution to the identified infraction, or they can appeal that to the commission. So there is this established documented procedure if there are infractions. But the gaming agents division does do more than that. Uh, for example, you know, they're monitoring and inspecting gaming equipment in the casinos, not only the table games, but also the electronic gaming devices. Uh, as part of their duties, they track and approve the movement of all the slot machines and perform strict oversight and regular review of progressive meters, for example. Uh, they also uh, monitor compliance with regulatory requirements, including adherence to the licensees, responsible gaming plans. They work with the ABC on compliance with alcohol measures and with the state police gaming enforcement unit to ensure compliance with prohibitions on minors being uh, permitted on the casino floor. Uh, the division also processes any complaints from the public relating to the conduct of gaming and wagering. That's required by statute. And they, as well, they require, uh, they conduct periodic reviews of operations uh, and facilities for the purpose of the commission's regulations, and they oversight, exercise oversight responsibilities with respect to gaming as required by Chapter 23K, Section 20. So there's a, a big part of the, the function on property is conducted by this division. Uh, obviously, they're very busy, always on the move doing a lot of these activities and just making sure things are operating where how they're supposed to be operating uh, core function of compliance uh, any questions on that before I move on to the uh, ITS division I had one question for um, mr. band I think he's still on Bruce are you there 
I saw him and he just may be on mute. And if he's not, I can try and field the question. Um, I, I, I was actually going to ask about um, some of the comparison with his experience in New Jersey. So oh, that okay. would be difficult for you okay. to, to answer Executive Director Wells, but not, not, not an issue at okay. all. Um, now, the other component of on-site compliance is the Information Technology Services Division. So our uh, uh, ITS division is comprised of two major teams. We have the Corporate Technology Unit and the Gaming Technolo Technology Compliance Unit. So the Gaming Technology Compliance Unit, or the GTCU, uh, they do a significant amount of work related to compliance by the licensees at the gaming establishments. Generally, the overview is that the GTCU ensures electronic gaming devices and associated equipment, so slot machines and associated equipment, as well as the back-end systems within the MGC and at the licensees, that they're compliant with all pertinent gaming regu regulations set forth by the commission. So, it, you know, the especially when you've got uh, slot machines, which are really just uh, uh, IT equipment. We've got an IT division to make sure that they work with the gaming agents on the compliance for that. Uh, they'll verify new operating systems. Uh, they test to, uh, they're testing uh, these performed on the CMS, our central monitoring system uh, for custom features. Um, they, they also uh, help the finance team understand accounting meter adjustments sent by the Network Operations Center or are not, allowing GGR or gross gaming revenue reconciliation uh, at each property. And they also upgrades or reports, uh, report additions are also reviewed when uh, and tested when upgrades occur at the CMX. So the GTCU fields requests from the IEB involving electronic gaming devices and non-electronic uh, gaming devices, such as your marketing kiosks, uh, to verify various items ranging from probability to accounting. Um, the GTCU also assists uh, the Research and Responsible Gaming Unit with technical compliance on Play My Way, which has been a very successful program and really something uh, that division can be very proud of. Uh, the product is evaluated for accuracy, functionality, and reporting in concert with the licensees and their in-house systems. So uh, a necessary function with any casino is uh, your IT division. And we've also got uh, the finance division, which uh, works with on-site compliance. The finance division works regularly with the casino to review its compliance with regulations as well as certain aspects of 23K. The majority of the regulatory requirements surround verification of the gross gaming revenue for taxation firms. Uh, casinos are responsible for providing uh, commission staff with estimates for daily, daily gross gaming revenue on a daily basis. And the finance division reviews the estimates and accompanying documentation and compares that to, um, to, the, CMA, to the MGC central monitoring system for reasonableness. In addition, the MGC's revenue office samples transactions uh, from the casino's tax packages for compliance of their system of stated internal controls. So again, like the gaming agents testing the internal controls, finance division also testing the finance control, uh, the, their finance division's internal controls at the casino. So there's a parallel there. Um, and then in addition on site, um, as required by statute, section 23K, of, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, chapter 23K, section 65, uh, which requires an audit of the casino property. The end, annually, the MGC employs an independent accounting firm, Bailey, to perform an audit of certain programs and their associated controls of the licensees. Uh, the scope of that audit is developed by members of the IV, the executive director's internal audit and compliance working group, uh, and that specifically includes the CFAO um, and the E. Bailey team from the data. So the MGC also files a report regarding these required audits and with the legislature before April 1st of each year in compliance with the statutory requirement under Chapter 23K, Section 65. So those are some of the uh, highlights of our uh, external on-site compliance at the casinos. So uh, I'll take a pause there to see if there's any questions by the commissioners, any comments, or any suggestions on anything we could be doing better or any, any areas you'd like us to look at when we're talking about compliance on property. Anything on that? 
Okay. All right. So, Karen, Karen Alf, you know, maybe, yeah, please. maybe now it's appropriate to mention just to, just to do a comment because I think it's a very good overview of the external program, uh, how much we do and how uh, critical it, it is to all the, the operations that, um, um, that are pertain to our, our mission. And um, one of the areas that I think you mentioned, but it bears emphasizing is this notion of coordination and how internal departments, different um, groups within our agency coordinates with external groups and other internal groups as well. You mentioned finance with technology as well as their own compliance uh, teams. And that's an area of focus that I think uh, is uh, very important and has been highlighted um, recently where you know, things could fall through the cracks, if you will, if somebody's concerned about one thing and someone else is concerned about uh, something else and there's little coordination. But I think uh, the way you outline in your presentation really emphasizes how, uh, how, how much we do on, in this effort um, in terms of uh, coordination. Um. Director Wells, if I may comment as well. Um, first of all, in preparing for this presentation, um, I guess I, it just struck me how comprehensive uh, the work is that we do. And um, in a short period of time, you know, five years since these casinos have been open, how much expertise our, our team has gained and how seriously they take their responsibilities. I had a chance to speak to uh, um, one of the casinos executives um, uh, recently about the work that we do um, and um, you know just really positive feedback about how comprehensive how how thoughtful um, the relationship uh, but just the fact that we really do pay attention to every single issue and uh, that is known by all the properties and um, it, it wasn't said in any kind of a bad way, just um, how thoughtful and comprehensive we really are about the work and um, just really impressed with the expertise that has been gained by this team in the last five years. Thank you. Anything else before I move to the next slide? Okay, Shara, if we could jump. Thank you, Shara. Um, oh, I think there's one in between. Hold on, mm -hmm. back up one. There we go. Oh, no, back up one. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with it. One no worries. It should be compliance with community and commission requirements. If you can find that one, that'll work. And if not, I can just move on if, if that's not going to work. Okay. Oh, so, it's okay. She can, we'll take two seconds. This yeah. is really helpful to have it in front of us. Do you like it? Okay. That, yeah. And, and besides, actually, we're ahead of time on yeah. time. It was it, it was interesting because it was Derek's suggestion to do the the PowerPoint uh, and I actually think it's a good idea. Very helpful. There, there we go. Are. Perfect, Shara. Thank you. Uh, so the next um, section, uh, which I'll put in the category of what I would call uh, external compliance, uh, is compliance with community and commission requirements. So this we've actually been through quite significantly in that. Uh, in that hiring of Joe Delaney uh, as the chief of the Community Affairs Division. We talked about uh, his hire and the renaming of that group uh, as the uh, Division of Community Affairs. This ties into that. So pulling together all the, that external compliance or compliance activities, they're not on property, but they are significant and they do uh, are relevant to our core mission here. Uh, so establishing that uh, community affairs division, I think, was helpful as sort of focusing it on the compliance piece of, the, of that formerly the ombudsman's office function. And so part of that division's uh, responsibility is to monitor and ensure uh, compliance with requirements that licensees have with the state and local communities, as well as requirements that the commission sets itself. Uh, so as I mentioned, when we talked about uh, Joe's uh, position, you know, this includes uh, host and surrounding community agreements, so the Section 61 findings, the license conditions, the RFA 2 application commitments, the licensee's capital expenditure requirements, and quarterly and annual reports. So there's a lot of uh, compliance activity that, that's uh, in a broader scope uh, handled by that division. So I wanted to highlight that independently from the on-site uh, compliance activities that the other divisions are working on. 
And the chief, um, Joe, regularly reports to me and, to the, and will be reporting to the commission on any issues related to compliance with community and commission requirements, in, including uh, reporting at scheduled public meetings. So you'll be hearing from Joe. Uh, and then also that division chief, uh, right now Joe Delaney, is also participates in that MGC internal audit or compliance working group, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So any questions on that? I know we just talked about that because of uh, the, the uh, uh, hiring of Joe's position, but I just wanted to um, see if there's any concerns, questions, or suggestions on that group and, and how we're approaching that aspect of an external, pardon me, external compliance. Yeah, Karen, uh, yeah. this is Bruce. The um, one thing that it, thankfully over the, the six, seven years that we've been doing this and the five plus years that we've had a casino in operation, it has not come up as an area of contention, but um, it is referenced in the statute and that I would just draw your attention to the I love agreements, yep. making sure that, again, nobody's raised a ruckus. We haven't had any uh, arguments or uh, concerns about it, but um, I would think that would also fall under Joe's. I know he and a team reviewed it when we did the PPC relicensing. So, right, that's exactly right. That's exactly the kind of thing that would fit into this group, this uh, this this bucket. You know, I'll just make a comment uh, on just on these. Um, I think I made it in the past, but um, there are when it comes to this category, there are. Uh, a couple of um, notably um, groups of uh, things like license conditions and section 61 findings, for example, that were uh, conceived when the licenses were first awarded and or their permits, their, their um, construction permits and environmental impact uh, permits are done. And a lot of those um, uh, conditions and, and findings, if you will, uh, were um, you know, ongoing, but many uh, were to be uh, resolved and have a sunset essentially. So there's um, a part of, uh, of some of these you know, categories where it's important to um, really finalize. Uh, and I'm not saying we have many or we, have, we haven't done uh, much of that in that regard, uh, but it's, uh, it's a different feature from the other category in terms of um, there, there will come and we have to be comfortable with the notion that some of these categories uh, have a final determination at some point and uh, many of them uh, remain. Right. That's interesting. Okay. Any other discussion points uh, for this area? Okay. All right. I'll jump to the next slide. Thanks, Shara. Uh, and so this this PC, you know, I'm, I'm finding very interesting. I found this whole exercise of, of preparing for this and doing the written documentation for this uh, quite interesting. In that, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we have a great deal of focus on our uh, licensees and ensuring compliance, and uh, for purposes of preserving our own integrity, holding ourselves to that high standard uh, is very important. So I just wanted to review for you some internal MGC compliance activities so you can get an overview and um, and if you have any comments, please chime in. So, you know, internally, uh, we do have, you know, we have various systems in place to ensure compliance with statutory requirements and best practices. You know, we do have a very high level, high functioning team. Um, you know, our, our divisions across the agency have documented policies and procedures to ensure internal compliance and ethical and efficient and consistent operations. Uh, I'm going to highlight a couple uh, areas just because a lot of these um, functions understandably have the most robust internal control systems at the uh, MGC. And that's the finance and HR team, as well as the information technology services division, so particularly the corporate technology unit. Um, so I'll start with the finance division just as a, as a high level. I and mean, we all know that you know, Derek comes with a lot of experience in state government, uh, highly meticulous. And uh, I think it's very impressive. The MGC's finance division has developed an internal compliance tracking database that tracks approximately 350 statutorily required and best practice activities, you know, in all areas from budget to revenue, HR, um, and, and then the HR finance combination. So that's, that's already going on at the office. And 
um, you know, I think Derek and uh, also Katrina and Todd are, are on the uh, at, on the meeting today and, and can contribute to any uh, comments or suggestions or just the discussion on what's going on internally. Um, so similarly, um, within the IT department, the corporate technology unit, which is separate from the gaming technical compliance unit, uh, ensures that information um, enterprise security policies, standards, guidelines, and procedures, that those are established and implemented and enforced. Um, so they have periodic reviews for compliance, and those are done with both internal and external audit teams. So there's a lot of information there that they are keeping secure and doing things um, that they are supposed to be doing uh, in compliance with not only state requirements, but also best practices. Um, so you know, I'll take a pause there before we go on to the, the next section because I think Derek and Katrina are on the on the uh, on the meeting. If there's any questions or if either of them would like to chime in on the um, you know the e efficacy of what they're doing right now and you know any any thoughts on uh, how this folds into our compliance uh, program uh, as a whole. So any questions by the commissioners? I have a comment, but not a question. Are we, is this Derek, do Derek and, uh, and oh, Katrina want to chime in? The only no. thing, yeah, the only thing I can say is um, this has been rather an organic process with the, it started off with Enrique and team in 2014, and we've been building to get to those various activities over the course of uh, six to seven years. Um, of you know we didn't start off with 350 activities we started off with probably 20 or 30 um, and we just kept building and building and building as um, different things came up and as the commission progressed um, so it's it's been a very good process and you know it has supported us throughout it it started off i think on a whiteboard then we moved towards excel now we use a microsoft project and hopefully we can continue growing from there as as the rest of the agency adopts this um, kind of format. Let me again. No, that's a, that's a good summary. I was, uh, it took me back to um, when I was a functioning CFAO and I knew my first activity was to try to get a CFAO. And um, Eric came in and, uh, and we really started uh, uh, essentially trying to button up, if you will, uh, our, our operations that started uh, very, um, very much in, upper, in, um, in startup mode, if you will, when we were conceived as an agency. So um, there's, by, by virtue of being the treasurer, I, I keep appraised of a lot of the, uh, the details of those 300 activities. I get some great um, dashboard uh, reports um, and uh, another, um, you know, transfer of money reports. But that's something, by the way, that I, I want to mention that, um, is up for any other commissioners to involve themselves if they want to and request some of these information. Um, and uh, eventually, as 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 my um, as my own uh, uh, time in the commission uh, begins to sunset, we'll also have to start planning on involvement of commissioner of the next commissioner as treasurer or um, other commissioners to to be appraised of these internal systems, which are really uh, mission critical. Thank you. I'm all set, Karen. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, the next piece just wanted to talk about just a little bit is the internal control plan. So uh, as I expect the commissioners know, uh, the MGC has a robust internal control plan, which was last revised in June of 2020. It's my expectation that we will be annually reviewing that. Um, and that, um, that plan was formulated under the guidelines uh, through the uh, guidance provided by the Massachusetts Office of the Comptroller. Uh, so we'll be following that. And even just, you know, I did, I think I believe I sent it out to, you know, all the staff, um, something that uh, it would be good for staff as well as commissioners and management just to take a look at. I know, I think, uh, I know one uh, staff member that responded after I sent it out. And it's, it's really helpful to sort of look at it look at it all as, as a whole and it's a helpful tool to not only look read it but also in development and revising it I found it very helpful this year just to look at what we're doing in, in our practices so uh, that is in existence um, 
you know, I know, uh, Kathy, we worked uh, quite hard on that, along with Derek and, and Enrique on that. Uh, I didn't know if the, any of the other commissioners had any questions on the internal control plan or that process, um, as far as the sort of state agency and management goes. Anything on that? I think um, the internal control plan is a statutory requirement that there's to be one in place in the annual review. So I think going forward, it's, you know, I, you've got your system in place, Karen, moving forward on, on the ICP. Right. Uh, another piece of internal controls is the internal uh, control officer. So the control provided uh, guidance with respect to key state finance law responsibilities and it describes different positions responsible for compliance with various aspects of state finance law. And one of those positions is the, is, uh, identifies the agency's internal control officer, which is considered a key fiscal contact, along with general counsel, chief fiscal officer, and security officer. Uh, so we did some research on that. The internal control officer is designated by the department head, which we've gotten some feedback has been deemed by the comptroller to be the chair of the commission. And then the guidance for roles and responsibilities of the internal control officer are as follows. And I'm actually going to go through these bullets because I found this really interesting and kind of helpful. Um, so the internal control officer, uh, one, should be equivalent in title or, or rank to an assistant or deputy to the department head. So that shows the significance that the controller places on the position, that it's a high level position. Uh, the individual works closely with the security officer. Uh, to ensure that uh, MARS security roles are updated whenever staff changes impact MARS administrator security roles and that all administrator roles are approved by the department head and filed as part of internal controls. So there's definitely a piece in with uh, the MARS system and the state system. Uh, it, it fulfills requirements of Chapter 647 of uh, uh, Acts of 1989, known as the Internal Control Law ensures that the department has a written internal control plan, which we just discussed, on file, and at least annually evaluates the effectiveness of these internal controls and identifies risks and makes recommendations to the department head for changes necessary to ensure the integrity of the department's business, including fiscal activities in Mars. So that risk assessment is something uh, we've been talking about for years at the agency. So, you know, I commend and uh, Commissioner Zuniga has always been talking about that in different areas of the office, but for this um, area, for this piece, it talks about uh, fiscal activities in Mars. Um, it also works with a payroll director, security officer, and general counsel to ensure that changes to key state finance law compliance roles are up to date and sent without delay to the Comptroller's office and ensures that all written and electronic communications from the Comptroller, Security Officer, and other applicable oversight departments are disseminated to the appropriate department personnel in a timely manner. Uh, so currently the internal control officer is the, at the MGC is, is Derek, the uh, CFIO. Um, my understanding from talking to Enrique is that had originally, um, been uh, appointed, uh, not sure that that was supposed to be a permanent position, but that was sort of the history there. I don't know if, if you want to chime in on that, but the, um, you know, it's really interesting these these bullet points on, on what the position is and what it does really does come from the controller. Uh, and I think uh, it, it's clearly a significant role in compliance uh, with, with throughout the agency. Um, so I don't know if any of the commissioners have any comments on that or any questions, but that's, that's where we are with respect to the um, internal control officer. Well, let, let me just emphasize what you, uh, what you said or perhaps provide a little co more context. Um, the, um, the initial designation of the internal control officer, uh, as, as, as Derek actually mentioned, happened organically fell on his, uh, on his purview um, because of his involvement in, um, and, and, and knowledge really, domain knowledge of, of a lot of these processes. Um, but that was in, 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 a, in consultation or in, in conversations with our own uh, auditor, Ed Bailey, um, you know, they brought up the point, which is a good one, that that should be deemed as a perhaps a short term or temporary uh, solution because a good internal control system should include looking at uh, objectively and, and, and externally at um, 
at the finance uh, operations, which the CFDO is a, a part of. So, um, so this is this is something for us to consider. I don't put that in the category of urgency, but um, and and as per the read from the comptroller, um, you know, the agency head designates that officer uh, with those attributes that uh, that Karen um, uh, mentioned. Um, and then we have a decision to make eventually uh, as to who this uh, responsibility should fall uh, to. I happen to believe that the involvement of a commissioner would be really appropriate. Um, and how we go about doing it is uh, an open question. Any, any other commissioners have any questions or, or comments or thoughts on that? And we can, we can certainly go back and do additional research, whatever we need to do. I think uh, connecting with the comptroller's office would be helpful, things like that. Any other question? Okay. So the other the other position is also um, uh, the designated security officer. Uh, right now, our designated security officer, not surprisingly, is our chief information officer, uh, Katrina, um, for statewide in enterprise system security. And uh, in accordance um, with the department head signature authorization and electronic signatures for Mars transactions policies and the statewide enterprise system security policy. DSOs, uh, the designated security officer, they're required to certify individuals' access to enterprise systems that contain financial, payroll, and related data. So this is a control on who has access to what to make sure the right people have access. Someone leaves the office, make sure they, their access is, uh, is disengaged. Um, and a list of those systems are as follows. So Mars, LCM, HR, CMS, uh, and CIW, the Commons Information Warehouse. So that's some of the things that we have as an internal control. We have a designated person in compliance with the controller's guidelines in the law on, uh, on who has access to what, and we do review that. Uh, it's also in tempo. That's the, um, uh, the Executive Office of Technology Services and Security's online security system through which uh, the DSOs and security administrators uh, request access to these enterprise systems. Uh, so the next piece is the, I just wanted to flag, is the internal control questionnaire. So state agencies annually submit an internal control questionnaire to the state comptroller's office. And what happens is the questions are designed to inform state agencies as to the sufficiency of their own practices and procedures. And it confirms that the agency has created an environment that is accountable to the public and demonstrates proper stewardship of resources. Um, auditors and staff from the comptroller's office, statewide risk management team, review those ICQ responses that state agencies file, and they may follow up with uh, specific questions. Um, and they also may review the internal controls in more depth and contact departments to follow up on prior year's findings. We file this document annually in uh, accordance with the comptroller requirements uh, going through that this year in 2020, very helpful, because if you're asked the question, do you have a plan for A or do you have a procedure for B, it ch it's a check to make sure, yes, I do have the plan for that. The agency is covered in that respect. So uh, it's a good tool that, that all agencies across the state use, uh, and we are in compliance with that. Karen, and, could, and could I just add on that? Yes. Um, the ICQ is a, a document that, um, you know, as Karen says, is, is critical to our own check on ourselves, but it is the tool that the that the um, the state uses to check on our compliance with statutory compliance on uh, our requirements. So um, that's it was with respect to last year when I joined. I the ICQ came. Derek, of course, informed us, and um, between working with the then executive director and myself, the comptroller um, office advised that the head of the agency needed to sign it. And in um, asking for that, that is where uh, the comptroller deemed that, that I should sign it as chair. With that, I just want to explain the process. Um, there's how many questions, Derek, on the ICQ? Um, Derek and I were both familiar with it from you know, prior jobs, but they're extensive and um, he went through every single question with me and well first with the the team that needed to help answer it 
then with each um, you know, relevant part, and then with the executive director, and then each question with me, we repeated that this year. And Derek and Karen were, and, and every team member who was needed were very helpful in making me confident that every question could be answered accurately. And uh, for that, I'm very thankful. Um, it will probably be a repeat, uh, a repeat um, exercise next year. And Derek is ready for the kinds of questions I'm likely to ask. But um, it is Derek's uh, coordination of really the entire team with Karen and the executive director's um, uh, leadership that gets that, that questionnaire answered accurately. But Derek, how, how many questions do you estimate on the ICQ? Um, I, I don't have it in front of me, but it's at least 80 some odd questions. And it deals with different areas ranging from HR controls to IT controls to fraud, waste and abuse controls at the uppermost levels, having a mission statement, having clear objectives. Um, we have legal controls that are in place. Um, so, you know, it, it is a really big coordinated effort of meeting with each group to make sure, and then that crosses over into other areas. I mean, there are some areas that cover into the gaming control. So you start dealing with the IEB. Um, there are some that there are systems controls. So we have to start talking to the uh, research and responsible gaming divisions as well as the game agents so there's a lot licensing division who has their own um, system you know it's asking about protection of PII payment card standards um, so you have to then get into the revenue side of the transaction so it's a really comprehensive document that's another thing that has grown over the 20 years I've been in state finance it used to be about a 10 page um, review that you had to do now it's upwards of 80 to 90 pages depending on how many areas you drop down into Right. So um, I just want to, again, I, I think uh, earlier when we were dealing with, in June, when we were dealing with the internal control plan adoption, how critical that, um, that process is in terms of compliance. And I remember saying to Karen, this, is, this isn't as nerdy of a tool as it is. It is a tool for you going forward in the exact activity that you're describing now on all the... Um, the broad range of compliance activities you have to deal with internally. So, uh, so I just wanted to explain that, that that's a more complicated than the name suggests. All right, any, any other questions on that, on the ICQ? Okay. I, I, so remember, it, I remember it at around 100 questions, but I think yeah. it's probably like 100 direct. questions. <laughs> Okay, so next next topic I wanted to uh, open up was the internal audit and compliance working group. Uh, for several years, we've utilized an internal audit and compliance working group uh, to assist with the internal risk ass assessment process. And that working group includes representatives from across the agency, including the executive director, the CFAO, the CIO, members of the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau, the General Counsel, Chief of Community Affairs Division, and up to two commissioners. Right now, we've had um, uh, Commissioner O'Brien and Commissioner Zuniga have been involved with that group. And, and other staff members at the agency may be included depending on, depending on issues that arise. So generally, we've been convening that a, a team monthly um, just to work on both internal and external uh, compliance operations. And, Historically, the group's responsibilities include an annual agency-wide risk, agency risk assessment uh, and a continual update of the MGC's risk matrix. So I think the, all the commissioners, you've seen that, and we've been doing that uh, for quite a while. Uh, we've, breaking it down by, we've broken it down by uh, department. Uh, we have a risk matrix which identifies risk within the agency, identifying uh, uh, risk mitigation plans for every identified risk. Uh, so that's been a, a, a good function of that group, um, and the working group. But you know, they do also review the licensees' audits that I referenced before, the annual audit that's required by statute, uh, and also their uh, licensees' own internal audit procedures. 
Um, and I expect that the working group will also utilize the ICP and the ICQ that we've talked about to help as a framework for evaluating the agency's internal control systems and the procedures. Um, so I expect, you know, as, as needed and as desired by the commission, I'm happy to report out uh, in conjunction with members of the working group uh, to the full commission on areas of importance or areas requiring full commission input. So I did also, you know, I, I did ask, you know, Katrina and Todd and Derek and um, to, you know, to be on the, on the meeting this afternoon to discuss this. And then we have uh, Commissioner O'Brien and uh, Commissioner Zuniga just to comment on the, the use of the group and some benefits they see or, or any vision they have going forward, just to get some feedback for me on what works, uh, what would be helpful and, and what would be uh, some best practices for the group going forward. So, um, you know, start with Commissioner Zuniga or Commissioner O'Brien if you have any comments um, or any thoughts on the group. Um, I really, no, Karen, I think this is great. I think you've done a really great job of making this concise for consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the MVC compliance um, group, um, I think it's been functioning pretty well. I do think, and we've talked about this before, um, one of the things I would love to hear from the other commissioners is their thoughts on structure going forward in terms of uh, we want to designate individual um, individuals within separate parts of the office to have additional responsibilities or do we want this more centralized and then reporting up to maybe you know that group and or the commission so I, I think you've covered most of it in the presentation already. I just throw that out because I'd be curious to hear what the other commissioners think who are not involved um, on a on a recurring basis. Right. Yeah, and, and if I can provide a, a little bit more uh, more background um, on 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 this, um, there's um, the, the group really is convened by the executive uh, director to to support. The executive director in the in the overall compliance uh, function, as 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 Karen articulates all the major elements here, it includes um, you know everything that, that that she said, but something that I had um, mentioned earlier relative to the critical function of ensuring that there's enough coordination and shared understanding among the key. Um, uh, members, uh, the key directors of the agency, on on the mission critical um, um, activities. So uh, you know, it, it, it's it's gotten to a good uh, a good cadence. A big part of of that group is reporting out, which is really a lot of what Karen is doing today um, to get that um, um, you know to get that feedback. Uh, but what what perhaps to to expound a little bit on what uh, Commissioner O'Brien is, is, is saying, um, where we have talked a little bit about without a lot of, uh, of, of resolution in the past is this notion of how do we test or how much can do we test in terms of our own internal uh, compliance and who is the best mechanism, what is the best mechanism uh, to do that? Um, and uh, what, what she's alluding to is by necessity, we have gravitated towards uh, the notion of, you know, relying on this group to go down to each of the directors to to think about their own um, functions and report back to that group. But there's an, there's another uh, alternative, and that is to have uh, a, a, an individual uh, with uh, not belonging to a particular group come in and test certain functions and report out. And that is one thing that I think, uh, again, we don't have to resolve necessarily today or, or in the very short term, but it's, a, it's something to consider as we continue um, strengthening these compliance uh, activities. Uh, and let me say one more thing, if I may, um, which is a good comparison that I know um, Derek has, has made in the past. There are very few agencies who get down to the testing of their own internal um, compliance, um, which is something that I that, that I think we do well in, 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 in compared to other to other agencies. Just given the, the situation that we uh, that we are in, frankly, a lot of the risks 
uh, have been addressed early on in Karen, present, Karen's presentation because we are essentially doing a lot of monitoring of, of the casinos themselves. Um, and uh, you know the risks are less when it comes to internal functions, but they're not without risk. And having us be thinking about you know how how to test uh, what we what we say we do, what we all know and think that we're doing, is is a is a, a great uh, um, thing to do and one that is done not much around other places. Any further comments or questions on this? Uh, Commissioner Stebbins or Commissioner O'Brien or Commissioner Cameron, I can't see you. Yeah, uh, I had a question for um, Commissioner O'Brien, which is, were you looking now for a response to your question or is it something to think about? Wait, wait, what were you uh, well, both. Um, if you both? have a visceral reaction to it, I'd love to hear it. Um, but if not, it's something that I'd like you to think about. No, I I, I'm sorry. Um, so, we're, so you're talking about um, getting an individual to go in and test um, someone from our shop with what a compliance background to go in and actually perform tests to see how well it's working. Is that is that what you're referring to? Well, it could be that, or it could be a position that functions within the agency, and so someone's either sole or partial responsibilities would be to either execute that or supervise the team that does it. And then that team could either be, you know, money notwithstanding, so not something we can do at this moment, you m could potentially have sort of an internal group that does that and maybe assist Joe's group in some sort of the outside compliance. Or you could do it certainly with, um, as an alternative, someone's responsibilities within each area within the office. Um, and then they work to go test the controls that are within an MGC. To Commissioner Zuniga's point, if it's done in a manner where nobody who is within that group is participating, other than potentially giving expertise and knowledge to understand what's going on, then you have controls in place to make sure that you're eliminating any sort of bias. So it doesn't have to be a third party coming in. That's actually not something that I personally would contemplate. It's more, is there a fixed position whose major responsibility or sole responsibility this is? Or is it um, s throughout the office sort of equal responsibility to different individuals? I, you know, just to, and I, I, I certainly will give it some thought and would like to hear more information about it. My first thought is if you, um, if you uh, have one person who, um, who has a partial responsibility, frankly, I don't think we're big enough to have a full-time person doing this, but if you had, you know, you built into their job description and say, this is a part of your responsibility and maybe they work at it, I don't know, once a month or whatever that may be. Um, and they would, uh, I, I just think for consistency purposes, it might make sense for one purpose, one person to have that responsibility, of course, other than for their own shop, they would not be able to, to do that for the area in which they work. But that seems to make some sense for me, just listening to the two of you uh, describe this activity. Commissioner yeah, Stebbins, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm just gonna ask if Commissioner Stebbins has another point of view, then we'll go back to you, Commissioner Zunigat, because I yeah, just can't you. see. I can't see Commissioner Stebbins. I'm here. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would, to answer Commissioner O'Brien's question, and. Uh, I think Commissioner Cameron offers a, a, a good answer, which is looking internally to see if there's somebody who uh, would be interested in having this be a portion of his or her responsibilities. Obviously, um, what might be an interesting conversation at some point is, you know, what are those reporting mechanisms? If it's, it's testing a department how does the feedback get shared? Where does it go? So the, the lines of communication for that internal control officer. But I think I think it's a great step for us to take. You know, we're a regulatory agency, as, as Director Wells has clearly pointed out. It's not just about regulating the people we regulate. It should also be making sure that we're we're regulating and looking at our own internal processes. Um, so I, I would be in favor of looking internally with somebody who might have the appropriate background or interest or skills, experience, uh, to see if that could be part of their 
time, um, as well as you know, come up with a plan. I, I, I think at some at some point, not now, but some point, it would be interesting to have an outside party kind of come in and test our test our systems. I don't know what the uh, you know how periodic that would be, but um, uh, I think that would be something worthwhile. But I like the idea of an internal person or somebody who's currently on the team who wants to, uh, who has an interest in the experience to take this on. So it might be helpful I, to jump to the next slide, Sharon. Oh, no, could, could oh, no, I'd like to chime in. Oh, um, please, no, it was just say, it's on the same topic. Sorry, it's the same topic. Um, and I know Commissioner Zuniga wanted to, to um, comment. I, um, I, um, I appreciate this exercise very much, Karen. Um, you know, we really haven't um, had any reports on sort of the compliance program since I've been here. Uh, we've certainly touched on pieces. So this is comprehensive and, I, and, 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 and more than a first good first step. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, I would, uh, because Commissioner O'Brien has asked that point of question, I think Commissioner, uh, you know, I would be aligned with Commissioner Cameron and, and Commissioner Stebbins in, in thinking, um, but most of all, I just want to point this out. I, when, when, I, when I think about our responsibilities and our roles, I always look at our, um, our, our legal framework because we have such an excellent statute. And, you know, in thinking about this, and, and I did bring it up to Karen that, you know, when she was thinking of becoming the executive director, what are her responsibilities? And under the statute, it does say that the executive director shall be responsible for administering and enforcing the provisions of law relative to the commission and to each administrative unit thereof. I think that this compliance um, program is really um, core to the executive director's responsibilities. Under our internal control plan, we said that um, you know, the Massachusetts Gaming Commission is a regulatory body charged with responsibility of ensuring the integrity and fairness of the casino industry in Massachusetts. And as such, we also, the commission, must adhere to our own policies, controls, regulations, and laws, and <clears throat> as well as enforce those relative to our licensees. The commission, though, has a significant responsibility to set the tone at the top. And I think we've done that, and you did, you did this well before I arrived in setting the values that we know that we know that we reiterate, um, and those values extend to the internal environment. They include an unyielding commitment to transparency, and most of all, an unyielding commitment to an exchange of, you know, robust exchange of ideas, opinions, and innovation. And, um, the testing function is that you're going to get into and, and how we oversee the compliance. If I had to, if, if I had to vote today, I would ask, and I, and I don't know if she's prepared to do this, I would ask our executive director for her recommendation as to what she would like to do to complete, you know, her obligations and, and, how, and would provide to her the assurance that we will do everything to set the tone. Um, uh, to make sure that we back her on that responsibility. So my answer really would be, you know, as, much as I, I like what I've heard from both Commissioner Cameron and Commissioner Stebbins, but I would defer to the executive director on how she thinks this compliance program should be effectuated. And, um, and to the extent that we need to provide additional resources or, or give further guidance you know, I'm supportive of that, but that's, you know, having thought about this a good deal, I have in my own mind, if I were in her shoes, what it might be, but I'm not inclined to share that. I really want it to come from, from the executive director first. Oh, dead silence. Yeah. <laughs> Any comments on that? And, and, but, I mean, and, but that's not to put you on the spot. I think I this is the beginning. Um, and I, and I think if you, you know, maybe in the next meeting, if you know, once you're hearing feedback today, uh, you know, when you think about the resources that are available, um, you know, I'm, I'm, 
I'm prepared to to really support what what you think works best in this enormously critical function. Yeah. Well, that, okay, let me just, Zuniga? yeah. Let me. I mean, that that is very much on on point and totally appropriate. I think um, first and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, um, these falls on their the role, the the purview of the executive director. Um, I think um, just going back to the question as to the format, I think there's there's pluses and minuses perhaps on on having um, one way or another. I, I think having a person who knows uh, that who is tasked, and I, by, by the way, I, I, I believe it would be partially because even where we are as an agency, a partial responsibility, um, you know, uh, fosters a sense of ownership, you know, a sense of, you know, having to respond periodically and report and follow up. Um, whereas, you know, if it's a little diluted uh, in, in, in each of the, um, uh, of the divisions, um, you know, there's, there's less of that, uh, of that ownership, but it's a little bit more uh, resource, um, uh, you know, less, less resources are, are dedicated to it. Um, I think uh, um, it's a good discussion to have. I don't think it's in, in, imperative to resolve now, um, but it's one of the things that, uh, as I mentioned, as we mentioned earlier, as we strengthen the program, is, is the thing for us to consider. So it might be helpful, you know, we kind of uh, organically went to sort of where we're going in, in the PowerPoint, just to, you know, on the, on the topic of internal testing, we do have, you know, the state auditor's office has the function of coming in and auditing different state agencies. So, you know, that routine internal testing um, ensures that state agencies are in compliance with, you know, state and federal laws, as well as their internal controls and policies and procedures. Um, but this, this exercise, um, may only take place once every three years. Um, so we can continually evaluate our internal program. And one of, one of the um, ways we can do that is just routine reporting to management. So management checking that policies and procedures and things are being followed and ensuring that we have those. And those being recorded up the chain through uh, different levels of management up to the executive director. And, and reporting on that, you know, on those set data points throughout the agency to ensure operational compliance is, I, I think, a, a critical function of any high functioning state agency. And then to your, to your point about this um, internal testing function, you know, where resources allow compliance, uh, a program for internal compliance testing. You know, we, we did talk about when you have a, a a dedicated person, it's a, a portion of someone's established time. You know, one of the uh, things we'd have to think about is the internal process would necessarily have to include protocols um, to address any potential conflict of interest in testing and reporting. Uh, so, for example, if that person, whether it's a, fun, uh, a portion of someone's time or an individual that this is that separate function, you know, if they're testing the executive director, did Karen Wells comply with each policy procedure? Yeah. Uh, then then report to the commission instead of to the person they're testing. There, there are certain procedures that we would want to work out on that to make sure uh, that we're doing things properly as in, in a sort of a chain of command uh, approach. Um, and then also, you know, not testing yourself. So if this is a portion of someone's time and that person works in X division, then that person should not be testing their own divisions um, procedures, so we'd have to have some kind of uh, other operational approach to testing that division's procedures, uh, so there's no conflict of interest. So um, yeah, these are just some of the things we're thinking about and, and working on. I recognize that uh, we're in a, you know, a bit of a resource crunch right now because of COVID and because of the financial position that the casinos are in and our um, sort of our ethical responsibilities with respect to finance management. So it's something we're thinking about, uh, but this is a, a good topic also to discuss with that working group, but it, it's important to me to get the whole commission's perspective on, on what, um, you know, what would be helpful there. But that's, that's, those are the, the lines that we're uh, thinking and that I think would be a, an appropriate approach. I, you know, I'm happy to have you know, Katrina, Derek, or Todd chime in on any, any thoughts on that and the internal testing, just so you can hear some, some other staff positions on that. But that's sort of, um, you know, this was sort of that, uh, last question I had within the, the presentation for today. Any thoughts by any 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 staff members? 
I don't know if Katrina or Todd or Derek want to chime in. It's fine if you don't uh, want to do that at this time, but I just want to give you the opportunity. Can I chime in on one thing? With respect sure. to the working group, you know, I'm not a part of the working group, but I, I have seen uh, some of the, um, I believe, the output of the working group. And that is in the internal control plan where there are the individual risk assessments. I'm assuming during that working group um, that that's part of the functions is to help yeah. um, assess division risk. And I, if, I think that that is an enormously helpful tool right. for you in the role that you have as executive director um, to uh, you know, not only assess the risk, but more importantly, how do you mitigate the risk? What tools are needed? And that might be things that are obvious, like training, policies, and procedures. But you know, using that group think to, to help you mitigate risk is critical and so um, you know i've seen that tool that matrix um, as part you know in effect and and i'm in in terms of looking at the internal control plan i relied on that matrix and and the belief that the working group is you know considering that and looking at that comprehensively so uh, I, you know i haven't heard commissioner zuniga or commissioner o'brien you know, a report on, on that function. Uh, but if that's occurring, I, I applaud that because I, I think many organizations would wish that they had that um, regular cadence of group think on, on divisional risk and how, you know, cross-departmentally you can help mitigate it. Yeah, that, that, that was very much a big uh, principle of, um, you know, when, when, uh, when this group was, was convened. Um, you know, I um, if I if I could go back to um, to Karen's uh, earlier point um, of protocols necessary when we when we think about testing ourselves, which I think is appropriate given our size and operations. Um, this is where I think uh, you know the role of a commissioner or commissioners up to two if it's internal discussions, uh, or up to five if it's a, a discussion like now. Is, is I think uh, very appropriate uh, where where uh, uh, somebody an internal resource is uh, is doing testing and and needs to have uh, a, a report or a conversation uh, about anything um, that uh, that may you know may go through um, through management as appropriate or to the co to a commissioner let's say or the working group as necessary. And that was another another principle of you know this group to try to convene for that sort of uh, coordination and facilitation of those kinds of protocols. Shara, you could take down the PowerPoint so the commissioners can see each other. That that might be helpful. There, yeah, great. Thank you. And Karen and the um, commissioners, if I may, just just briefly, I thought this is a really great conversation, very thorough, and I, I don't have too much to add other than highlighting just one point, which was, I think, in a, in a, a critical piece is, is just ensuring that there's an effective communication plan in place, both internally and through the executive director to the commission, and really uh, making sure that everyone who needs to know uh, certain information is made aware what's going on in different respects. And everyone has access to the information they need to perform their duties effectively. So that's, again, nothing to resolve here today necessarily, but I think also a very important piece of uh, shoring up our compliance culture. No, so I'm building on Commissioner Zuniga's point, if, if um, because I think Karen, you raised, um, you know, the, the issue of conflicts and which I you know, fully appreciate. I, I do think those are manageable. Um, I don't think that the risk of having a, a occasion where there's there is a direct conflict, um, we can manage that. The overall benefit of having a testing, you know, component is so high that we can manage the the risk attached yeah. to some conflicts. Uh, so let's just let's play this out. You know, if if in fact you decided to to include in your plan uh, the recommendation of of somebody internally to 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 do your testing my, my sense would be that that would be absolutely appropriate for 
you to be the, I mean, because again, I go back to the statute and if I were you, I'd want this. I mean, you, you have to have your reports reporting to you on compliance. You have, if you're having a tester, you have to have the tester reporting to you. If they're testing you, that's an obvious, uh, an obvious conflict. Or if the tester reveals, you know, something that would make the tester uncomfortable going to you, I think I'm hearing Commissioner Zuniga, you might want to have an alternative channel of reporting. Right. And I think Commissioner O'Brien, you can chime in if I'm if I'm close here. But if that's what we're imagining, then perhaps um, a designated commissioner who doesn't have other responsibilities, in you know, and somebody who um, is, you know, would be the, the, the safe channel um, for confidential contact might be appropriate. And that might be something that, you know, that you might not feel comfortable as part of your overall plan. You know, like I, th I say, I'm gonna defer to you on your plan, but if, you, if, there, if the commission felt that they should have that reporting channel in the, you know, to the extent that the tester needed an alternate. Right. Um, to you. Uh, we've, had, we've had a lot of conversations about that because you really, we, in my view, that's mandatory or else yeah. the integrity mm -hmm. process is suspect. Yeah. Because yeah. you cannot, you have to have an avenue to go around the head in that regard. Yeah. For just that any allegation of intimidation or embarrassment or hesitation needs to be addressed by having an alternative form. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about is it one or two commissioners who are designated in the event that maybe one of those commissioners is involved as well. So do you have a primary and a secondary? So that the person can say, I'm going to this person because even if I, I still have concerns about going to commissioner so and so. Yeah. Not to include anyone's character who's on this meeting, but it's just you have to deal with the worst case scenario. Yep, worst case scenario. So to that extent, you, you know, Karen, in terms of a plan, that could be, you know, obviously something the commission would need to take separate action on, I suppose, if you're going to designate someone to the commission. I, and I suspect then, Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Zuniga, it, is appropriate that it is that commission level, because uh, otherwise the correct channel would be to the executive director. Right. I mean, in agreement. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, the one the one thing that I would uh, you know remind ourselves is that um, if the commission, the five of us, designate to designate up to one um, commissioner, if that's the case, or if we're at that point ever, or you know soon. Um, in order to uh, not inadvertently create a subcommittee uh, of, of the commission, because sometimes these, um, the, this, the worst case scenario that, that uh, Commissioner O'Brien alludes to um, is not necessarily one that will come to a public meeting uh, necessarily, first and foremost. Uh, one in which first one, one commissioner would have to be, again, designated. So I guess if it's two separate channels, though, if it's a channel, like a primary one, I don't know if that's a subcommittee issue, but can we chew on that and yep. not necessarily resolve that today? Because that's a, something maybe Todd can give us advice on. Does everybody agree with that? Um, but I hear what you're saying. Um, so it sound, uh, sounds as though you've gotten some good feedback, Karen, on, on uh, possible testing arrangements yeah and yeah and, and you know I think, I think it might be helpful. i'm going to put katrina on the spot because you know those of you our cio has also a background in compliance so um you know she's been involved in this working group and you know just want to give her the opportunity just some thoughts on what we're all talking about if there's any other areas we should be exploring or researching uh and just based on your compliance experience if you have any thoughts on, on this discussion that probably be helpful for commissioners hi katrina hi good afternoon um, you know, the good news is the working group has done a really exhaustive job of, of batting this concept around for quite some time. And, um, you know, through the efforts of Enrique and Derek initially with the risk mitigation matrix that they had developed over time really kind of gave us a framework of the things that we're looking at and, and evaluating. On the high note, we are doing internal testing. We are doing checks and balances on ourselves. And I think what really evolved from the working group was developing a much more formal process and really creating that formal workflow that we don't initially have today. And 
I think all of the things that we're talking about and all the concepts that we've thrown around and really developing that framework and methodology and ensuring that there are no conflicts of interest and if there, is, if there are exceptions, what those paths will be, I think is, is something that I think we've, we've already discussed and had a really robust conversation about it, but obviously not something we're gonna be able to solve today. So I feel strongly that we're on the right path. I think you know, everyone echoed the same theme of being, you know, being that example, but leading by example of what we expect our licensees to do, doing that ourselves. And I, I definitely think we're on the, on the right path. Thank you. Does Derek want to chime in? He just popped in. Um, I, I think Paul would like to speak up to the, um, to the internal audit section, but you know, I, I this is a very good discussion. Um, I think that people come out from all different ways, so it's 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 been a very nice um, thing to be a part of. But obviously, if we had all the money in the world and um, the perfect structure, we would hire someone, have them come in and be doing this regularly. Um, you know, that that would be their whole job: review everyone's risk assessment review everyone's policies and procedures and then do some testing against that. So if and when an audit does come through, we've done a thoroughly exhaustive. Um, the approach we have in place right now is the best alternative to that um, because we can do what you've brought up. The group think, um, sit down and think about have we identified all the areas? This is what we think our key risks are. Have we taken a chance to take a look at those programs and read through and made sure that we think we have the right control activities? And then try and set up internal um, reporting and internal review of, of those documents and some testing. Um, but that is subject to not having, you know, someone from the outside come in and take it, or someone not in that program come in and take a really deep dive into it. Um, but it's a lot better than most agencies I've ever worked in are doing. Um, so, you know, I think this really comes down to if we had all the money in the world, we would be doing the first thing I said. And, you know, um, it's something that I think we're trying to get to. And what Karen talked about, maybe using some internal resources to test areas that are not so have someone from IEB test me, um, have someone else test a piece of the IEB's controls um, is, is where we're headed towards in, in to, to make this program more robust in the interim. But um, I know Paul's on right now, and Paul, if you wanna jump in and talk about the, um, the internal audit compliance piece, that would, that would wow, he's even in the- Bow tie. <laughs> I had this on for uh, earlier today, but um, well, traditionally, I was just going to uh, make the comment that internal audit usually has a dual reporting role, um, and that's exactly for the purpose that we've been discussing to avoid any conflict of interest or potential reporting issues. Uh, traditionally, internal audit would have a functional report to the audit committee of the board of directors. In this situation, it could be the commission, um, all the commissioners. Um, and then administratively to the CEO, in this case, we, the executive director, Karen. Um, and that does eliminate a lot of those problems that you've been discussing about the dual reporting. Um, there's a lot of documentation information that can be find, end up found on uh, the IIA's websites, the Institute of Internal Auditors. Um, so I'd be happy to forward any of that if you're interested or discuss it. Yes, please. Well, thank you, Aaron. I'll send it on to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so at, yeah, so that's sort of the, the general uh, overview of, of what we're doing, which I think is a lot, and I think we're uh, way ahead of the game uh, within state agencies. But I just wanted to get some feedback. This is discussions been really helpful. Um, so I'll, I'll report back on sort of where where we're headed and some options and some structure. But I'd like to work with you know the internal team that that we have going on um, how we would move this ball forward. Sounds good. Any further yeah, questions you. for Karen, or the commissioners? Well, it sound, sounded like we were uh, wrapping up the dis this discussion just to say that it's a really great presentation, Karen, really uh, a good discussion. Everyone, 
um, and, uh, uh, and again, it's the exercise uh, of going through these, thinking about these procedures, thinking about roles, uh, doing this periodically is in and of itself a big part of the compliance function. It forces us to be disciplined uh, and, um, and again, having this kind of report periodically um, is going to be also a favorable thing for the overall program. Thanks. Great. Any further questions for Karen and team on this? Commissioner Stebbins, all set? Commissioner Cameron? Yeah. And Commissioner O'Brien, uh, you want to? Commissioner O'Brien, I'm sorry, I muted myself. Do, I, do you want to wrap up with any comments because of your involvement as well on the working group? No, as I said before, I think Karen, um, the work she put into the, the, the PowerPoint, gelling it down, I think was effective for the conversation. It was a great job, Karen. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. All right, um, then we're moving on to, um, wow, this is amazing, Marianne. Do we have target? 12.55 to start item number 10, and it is 12.55. <laughs> so, um, Marianne's magic. It, um, we are right on time. I guess we're uh, now, Todd, you're going to lead this discussion today. Thank you. Sure. And thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Again, um, We've recently been confronted with an interesting issue relative to the confidentiality of information that's provided to the commission by a gaming licensee under a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, and specifically, the commission was provided with non-gaming revenue data uh, for purposes of conducting economic impact research. So the question uh, before us here today is whether the commission can publish such information publicly as part of uh, such a research report. And to answer that question, uh, I would suggest we have to look at the language of the non-disclosure agreement, as well as a number of other uh, sources of law. And I note that the uh, commission has executed uh, non-disclosure agreements with each of the gaming licensees. Each of the non-disclosure agreements are substantially identical in content. Um, and by way of background, the non-disclosure agreements are addressed in chapter 23K. It's section 21A7 that says that as a condition, uh, condition of licensure that uh, each licensee is required to make readily available all documents, materials, equipment, personnel, and other items requested during an investigation provided that uh, the materials, any materials that the gaming licensee considers a trade secret or detrimental to the gaming licensee if it were made public may with the commission's approval be protected from public disclosure and the gaming licensee may require a non-disclosure agreement with the commission before disclosing such material. So that's what the statute uh, talks about. The commission, you may recall, then went on to codify this non-disclosure NDA process in its regulations and that's at uh, section 139.02 of the regulations. In there, the regulation says that the licensee may request that the commission enter into a written non-disclosure agreement, uh, which again, each of the licensees have and the commission has agreed to execute, under the terms of which the commission agrees not to release the specified material or information publicly in response to a request for public records or otherwise, and will assert the statutory exemptions if we do get a request, essentially. And so it's a pursuant to these authorities that the, again, the commission executed NDAs with the licensees. And there are a few provisions in the NDAs uh, that are worth mentioning in order to answer the question uh, before us. The first is in section four, which talks about uh, the handling of requests for public records. And it says that the commission agrees that it will not voluntarily publicly disclose any information or materials that are the subject of this NDA agreement, whether by way of a response for a request for public records or otherwise. And in the event that the commission receives a request for the disclosure of any such materials or information, it will deny the request, withhold the materials, and assert the statutory exemption and or any other exemption that may apply. 
Under the terms of the agreement, uh, however, the commission did carve out for itself an ability to make use of information that it receives so that it, it's not unnecessarily um, uh, unable to make use of uh, certain information that it comes into the possession of. And this uh, is covered in section six of the non-disclosure agreement, which talks about use of materials by the commission. And it says that nothing contained in this agreement, meaning the NDA, shall be construed as to prevent the commission from making use of any information or material by the gaming licensee or otherwise as part of an investigation, disciplinary matter, or in any other manner deemed necessary by the commission. So that's the, the provision that's, uh, that carves out the commission's ability to make use of certain information that may otherwise be covered by the agreement. So while this, this type of uh, information cannot be released by the commission pursuant to a public records request, the commission come, can in some respects make use of information in certain circumstances. As it pertains to non-gaming revenue, the NDA lists um, a variety of information and documents that are covered by the agreement. And you'll recall having looked at the agreements recently, I believe that we cover 25 to 30 uh, categories of information. And that includes uh, one provision that addresses financial statements and disclosures outside of what is publicly available via SEC filings. And depending upon the licensee, non-gaming revenue would seem to fit into that category, particularly as it applies to uh, MGM and Penn National uh, Gaming, which does not publicly disclose non-gaming revenues by property. They each disclose it in their SEC filings by essentially region. Um, and they, so they basically aggregate the numbers uh, by properties within a certain region. And so it is with MGM Springfield that uh, their non-gaming revenue figures are not reported publicly in the, their SEC filings that are reported out by their parent company, MGM uh, Resorts. In providing any such uh, information to us, uh, an assertion of this non-disclosure agreement that we have executed with that licensee uh, was raised um, and uh, request that the information be handled in accordance with the NDA uh, was made to us. Which brings us to the ultimate question, which is whether non-gaming revenue in this context should be public re publicly reported. The question is not whether we should have received the information, but whether it, we should publicly report it, that is to include it in a published report uh, relative to economic development impacts of the respective uh, casinos. And again, this is the, the specific question is not our access to the information, but the public reporting of it. So that's, that's essentially uh, the issue. I, I can field uh, any questions there are as to the legal authorities that govern uh, this, but I believe that those are all the principles of law and fact that uh, govern the commission's review of this matter. So what is your exact ask then? Well, the, I guess the ultimate question is whether the commission should publish the non-gaming revenue uh, information relative to MGM Springfield in its economic development, uh, economic impact report. And at this time, the um, MGM um, position, just to be clear, that would be that they would say that it's protected under the NDA. Is that fair? That, that's that been uh, uh, their position. Uh, Mr. Stratton is on the call here yep. with us to address any specific questions, but that is the, uh, the ask. Yep, okay, thank you. Commissioners? Um, that, that's a great summary, Todd. And, uh, but um, can I go back to the part where you were saying financial statements and disclosures, the line exactly in the, um, in the NDA yes. that MGM asserts. Um, because I believe um, 
like many things in life, the devil's in the details. And um, what we are uh, talking about here is an aggregate number of a number of disclosures that they do um, routinely for different segments, granted not by property of their operations. So what, what was exactly that line that you read? Um, in the, in, in the uh, MTM Springfield NDA, it's provision 12 on the chart, and it, it says, subject to proper identification by the gaming licensee, which they did do, uh, financial, it covers financial statements and disclosures outside of what is publicly available via SEC filings. And then we exempt out the certification we require in our quarterly report, but that's not relevant here. Right. And we are not talking here about a financial statement, but a very small component of, of, of you know, of what is normally in a financial statement. Uh, and that would be gaming revenue. And it's also not a non-gaming revenue rather. Uh, right, we're, we're not we're not talking about disclosing this the financial statement or the you know the the or the property. Um, nowhere near that. Well, I, I, I suppose that is part of the question: is whether you believe non-gaming revenue data is considered a financial statement or disclosure. Is it, one, is it a dis, could you just say it's a financial statement or disclosure of it's a, or a disclosure that's outside of the SEC filing? Is it does it have to be a financial statement or is it a disclosure? I, either, it says and so either or a, a, it's an and it's an and yeah it's, it's an and but 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 it's we're not talking about a disclosure either a disclosure you know I know we're not uh, it, it, I'm trying to make the point that. Um, you know, this is this is only what one component of what, admittedly, um, falls on, you know, regularly under a financial statement. But it's not a financial statement. Can you read it one it's more time? One. You know, I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry. I'm I'm having a little bit of a uh, technical issues. I, I I don't know if you could share yeah. that information. Absolutely. Well, I can share the the whole. I document. see other people looking at their screen, and I'm I can't look at mine. I'm sorry. Sure. No. Read by uh, memory. It's just a limited part that I, I believe is relevant here it says financial statements and disclosures outside of what is publicly available via SEC filings. So any disclosure that is publicly available in an SEC filing is not covered by this NDA for good reason, obviously. Um, the what this covers is any financial statement or disclosure um, about the property, obviously, that um, is not otherwise publicly reported. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, and that is, uh, you know, there was a big concern when we did these non-disclosure agreements relative to the parity between the property and and their consolidated statements, um, and you know. And, and, and this is where it, uh, where, where, where the language ended. Um, but again, maybe I made this point already, but um, we're talking about not a financial statement, but one line in the financial statement. And by the way, I will also mention um, in the regular disclosures, uh, in the regular reporting of, uh, on the SEC reporting, uh, they do break out um, by segment, um, the non-gaming revenue into multiple categories, um, convention, food and beverage, hotel. Um, that's part of their financial statement disclosures. Um, granted, by, uh, by line, by, by um, uh, I don't know what the, what the category, by category, yes, Las Vegas, regional casino, international, uh, not by property. Uh, we are talking about here, aggregated an aggregate of what is otherwise itemized in their financial uh, disclosures uh, when it comes to non-gaming revenue. Now, um, I also want to say this because I am, I am of, of mixed feelings about, about this uh, request. Um, I think there's a case to be made that, um, you know, that this is not part of the NDA 
uh, when we are talking simply about um, the aggregate of non-gaming revenue and that it also is in the public interest, which is why we're doing a lot of the research and many other sections and research uh, apply. Um, but I, that is also further uh, complicated by what I believe is a legitimate argument, one that we have to weigh against those two competing interests, um, that um, you know, there's sensitivity towards competition, that um, especially when it comes to, um, to MGM, they are uh, unhappy uh, from, from, from a little while um, in a tight gaming market, uh, which, um, which, which is frankly uh, the unstated uh, part of their concern, in my view that uh, disclosing some of this information may be dis disadvantageous um, when it comes to um, you know, their, 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 their competition. Um, I think there are mitigating factors for that. Uh, for example, we're not talking about disclosing the, the, the non-gaming revenues over time um, or with any more break at, you know, detail. Um, like you know, hotel, food and beverage, or or convention, um, we're talking about an, an aggregate number. And I think uh, when we had these discussions early on, when they were providing, when we were asking for this information, our researchers were asking for this information, and they were providing it, um, the discussions all in my mind ended up well. Maybe this is all a matter of how it gets aggregated and reported. Um, and I think that's where we find ourselves. Commissioners, other comments, questions for Todd or Commissioner Zuniga? Commissioner O'Brien? Uh, I think what Commissioner Zuniga just wrapped up his comments with is, is sort of, you know, where I am, I think. It's a question of the forum and the manner in which to disclose it. Um, I do think it's relevant information. Um, I, I, the question really, if, if the question before us, Todd, is it very, very narrow today? Just is that number supposed to be in that report or not? Versus are we having a bigger conversation about whether we want to continue to ask for this information and publish it, and if so, in what way? I, I think that's a great question. I, I think it's it's kind of both. I mean, the more immediate question is, should we put this specific number in this specific report? But it obviously could have broader implications. Because um, my I mean, it, yeah, my point being, if the if the answer is yes today, I think we're answering the broader question, and so I think we do have to have a bigger conversation about that. Um, cause it would got, there, there could be a circumstance we say in the future, yes, but given the circumstances of how this came about, we're going to decline to put it in this report and that wouldn't bind us later. Uh, but I question whether if we put it out now that that doesn't answer the question going forward. And I, um, I definitely think we should be doing this going forward. And then we have a conversation about how, uh, but so I, Commissioner O'Brien, can I ask your opinion? Uh, cause I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with. Um, one, um, the idea that that this information is doesn't um, is not protected. Um, I, I understand there's an exemption of the the use of the information for something we deem necessary. I understand that exception. I'm struggling with the idea that this isn't protected. I hear Commissioner Zuniga, but do you agree that it's not protected? Um, because because of the, the narrow reading that it's just a piece of a financial statement, so therefore it doesn't fall under that exception. Because if that's the case, then you know we would we would have a different a different response to MGM. Or do you think it's protected, but then you're getting to the the the, the exception under the NDA? Well, it's funny, in terms of that broader question of the NDA, I actually think this is not the forum to have that conversation. I actually think that's a conversation that should be done in more depth. And maybe I'm wrong on this, Todd. Um, if MGM's counsel wants to make that specific argument, um, 
I'm under the impression we're here today on a fact specific request having to do with this particular report. And then there's been an analysis done of the disclosure in this particular circumstance. And I do think that the facts of this are a little bit different than the question you just asked, Kathy, which is a strict legal reading of this. Is it or is it not under the NDA? Either protected in the first instance, or if it is in the first instance, then it's subject to an exemption. Um, and I'm not so sure we really got into that level of discussion on this, as opposed to the fact-specific request of, here's how this evolved in this moment, and we don't know whether or not to redact this number from this report. So if we, so I'm hearing you, and I'm, I'm struck by this because um, hearing you saying, I'm not sure this is the right forum. This is the only forum we've got. Um, you know, unless it falls under well, an executive session. No, no, no. Session. I'm saying as a question of law. There is a question of law. Yeah. No, but I'm saying I, I have, and again, Todd, if you can, you know, help me understand this. But as I was sort of brought up to speed on this, yeah. it was uh, a narrow question for us today, but that had broader implications. And so my understanding is that's the conversation that's happened and that we're having today. And I do think that what we do today could have broader implications for how we move forward and interpret this. But I'm not so sure that we were positioning ourselves today to have that in-depth conversation about the statutes in the NDA. But I could be wrong. I, what I would say about, I think, at least one piece of that is I operated with an understanding that this data was protected under section 12. That was my read. I hadn't really considered that it wasn't, although the commission could certainly step in and say, you know what, you have that wrong. It's not covered at all. And I, 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 I certainly leave room for that. Um, but that so was not, say, yeah. let, Can we make then the assumption that, let's just for purposes of this discussion today, assume what you, what I had understood was your legal interpretation and to that extent, it was aligned with MGM's position that, it, yes, you know, it, it may fall under that. I he, I'm hearing Commissioner Zuniga, you know, as counter, but let's just, if we could go through the assumption of, okay, it's protected, then um, can, then, so the next narrow question would be, if this were a request from, let's say, a researcher, through a public records request, a researcher, not, not our contractor, a researcher today, under our NDA, we would have to deny that if we assume it's protected. Is that correct? That's right. If this came via public records request, uh, the legal department would deny the request and cite the existence of the non-disclosure agreement and the statutory exemption to the public records law and decline to produce the information. So, but can, can I, can I put a fine point? Can I put a fine point to that? Because I think this is where it hinges. If we, if, if we were given the request of give us all the information you have relative to non gaming revenue with all of the throughout the months and with all its breakdown, then I would say absolutely that's protected. It was not, you know, that is all that detail clearly falls under, under the NDA, in my view. The, and again, maybe this is a difference without a distinction, but I'm saying that what the researchers have proposed for, again, the public interest, which is the other part, is that we put out the aggregate. It's just, it's, 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 an, it's a number, it's not the detail. And I guess maybe that becomes the question, when is detail versus aggregate part or not of, of an NDA, if we are of the opinion that one piece of it, you know, means everything, then maybe that's the answer. Uh, but uh, if 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 you um, buy at least partially my my the argument that I'm trying to make uh, that you know it is relative to how much detail um, and how much um, can be reported as a compromise so uh, for the other for the other. Um, 
other goal of, of, of the research program. By the way, can I make so, a, a parenthesis? You, but Enrique, you didn't stick with my assumption. My assumption was just that right now, this is uh, what yeah. Todd has oh. advised, that this is protected. So I'm just well, playing it out. So then, so then we wouldn't disclose that under it. So then the next piece is to look as the exception. I just want to play out, uh, you know, assuming this is protected. Then the next piece, just to make it really simple, the next piece is, under the exception, the use of the protected material, if we deem it necessary. And you know, I'm hearing Enrique say, you know, public interest. So somehow there's some kind of a standard we attach in just deciding what is necessary. But it's the use; it is not the publication. So when you when the NDAs were written, you know, I I wasn't here. Was there? A reason why you didn't say we would be able to publish and override really the you know the public records law. You said use, and so that's what I'm struggling with. Um, if again accepting the assumption, not the quality or anything, but what, what Todd has said that this would be protected. Do we get to? Do we get to publish it, or can we just use it? And is there a way? that we can do the use and still accomplish what, you know, I know um, Mark and, and um, would like and the researchers would like. Is there, is there any way we are using it without publishing it? Well, I, yeah, I think that's, that's where we are currently with, uh, with the report. Uh, the reason, and by the way, I don't know if this is much of a difference, but it's our researchers who have used that information. It's technically not us. Uh, oh, but, I know. I'm, but they're that's, our contractor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I don't know that that matters much um, to the to the main point. Um, I think they've they've used that information, and that that that's great because that has allowed them to do a number of things. Um, it's the publishing of the report that they're reporting out um, that that is the key question. And again, I thought there is a balance by saying. Okay, don't report all the detail, but report the aggregate. And does, the way, it, does the MGM see that distinction, Todd? Do you know? I know that Seth is here. I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and say that they don't. Okay. Um, you know. Well, I just, Madam Chair, to your point, I, I would say that as comprehensive and thorough and thoughtful as I find this NDA to be, um, we never and some of the licensees are on the line here and they can certainly weigh in on this. I don't believe any of us ever specifically contemplated this exact issue. Um, and so for that reason, while I do believe it's covered under the agreement, it's not one that anyone spent a lot of time talking about or thinking through and the use, what is, what do we mean exactly by use and is inclusion in a public report use or was the use before it was put in the report? Um, so that's, I mean, I think that's why it's, in part, it's a legal interpretation and in part, it's a policy question um, as to how to fairly move forward uh, with this information. Can I mention one other thing? Uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry if, if this is going to be uh, uh, muddying the waters a little bit, but people should at least, uh, commissioners should also understand that they, uh, the researchers have come up with an alternative themselves to estimating the non-gaming revenue. In other words, saying, "All right, we if we don't, if we don't have to use that, maybe we can still have a report that does justice does justice." I'm sorry, to the original intention and tries to estimate that. Now, that's not going to be the name the same number. Um, one could argue that well, they they are coming up with the estimate after they saw. <laughs> The original aggregate number, and whether that's, you know, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, but can I you share their to, methodology? Um, I, that would be a question that Mark might need to help me answer. But Mark, am I? Can you um, can you respond to that question? Am I wrong in the notion that there is an alternative to estimate that number um, that is uh, independent from? Um, the, the, the data that they received? Uh, yeah, um, good afternoon, uh, commissioners and madam chair. Um, yes, they, they have come up with a couple different methods in order to estimate 
um, non-gaming revenue. Um, I have to say nobody uh, nobody was particularly um, satisfied with with the methodology and the and the outcome of that though. Um, and so the, the feeling was that if we could use that actual number, um, it puts it, it, it strengthens the report and really gets to the heart of what we're trying to measure. And just to be clear again, when that, the way we got that information, it was directly from MGM, but they did note um, that they didn't want it. Yeah. Well, they, 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 did, they did note that, you know, that they expressed their concerns early on. And so, and that's where, um, so it's, it's, it's fair to say that, you know, they, they had an understanding. Um, and, and I, be, and, and, and by the way, I'm going on memory because I was at least some, sometimes involved in those discussions. Um, in my, my um, recollection was that, you know, it was going to be relative to how much detail is, is eventually out there. Uh, as long as we're not, you know, opening up all the research data. Uh, which were not um, that you know that that would be some something that uh, that they could label. Now, maybe maybe I misunderstood their position. That that's that's entirely possible. But I think that to me is the differential between. And and, and let me mention one one other thing. Uh, it is possible if we if we try to begin to answer that other question, the second question that Commissioner O'Brien says about the policy implications. I think it is possible that we will get less cooperation um, in terms of data gathering going forward, um, because you know um, it, it's understandable. In other words, even even if we um, came up uh, very strongly on, on on one side saying you know we don't think it's covered, uh, there's an implication for the future. You're not asking for a vote today, Todd. Uh, um, not, no, it, it, I mean, I kind of almost defer to Mark. I'm not sure what the time frame is for this and what the urgency is. I believe the report has, is it fair to say, has not been formally published at this point pending an outcome of this decision? Right. Um, I am uh, awaiting a decision by the commission about how to proceed on, on the non-gaming revenue in order to get direction to our research team. Um, the, the report, which it's hinging on this one specific issue, and obviously the, the report has much, much more than, than the non-gaming revenue. I am anxious to get this report done and published, um, and so the sooner the commission can give me some direction um, on that, um, the better. Um, I, I see, you know, I, I can see where the commission may say, um, not for this this report, we, we advise that you don't use the uh, exact number for the non-gaming revenue, um, but let's have a discussion going forward. Um, that, um, that seems like an option too. Director Wells, how do you want to proceed? I think, you know, I do, I do see Mark's point because we're, we're in, we're in limbo. There is, is no vote today. Uh, I don't know if you want to hear from Seth Stratton and we haven't heard from MGM, that would be helpful to commissioners. He's on, uh, I'll leave that to your discretion if that's helpful. That, that's only if Seth, Seth should not feel like he has to, but if right, he Right, exactly. Have, I, Good I was afternoon. perfectly comfortable not commenting. Oh, okay. Well, you can not <laughs> it, comment. It's that's a thorough fine. discussion. Um, I'm happy to address any questions, but um, I think Todd's teed it up exactly the right way, and I agree with everything he said. So there's nothing we've missed. Todd's covered everything. Correct. Okay. Do you want, um, if I can just, I'm listening to everyone here. Um, and the one, the one piece I, I think I'm very clear about, so I'm not clear about every piece, is that any portion of a financial report, I think, is covered. If you don't use it all, I, that's how I always understood it. When I spoke to Todd about this issue, that was my understanding that um, that a portion, you know, that this is covered. There was never a discussion about maybe this isn't even covered. So I'm agreeing with Commissioner O'Brien, I believe, that, that that's a different discussion if now we're going to say it's not covered. In my mind, if it's a piece of it, then that's that's covered. But it, so just to clarify in my mind, because Todd and I talked 
there's the covered by the NDA, but then as to Kathy's point, it, do you want to sort of invoke the exception on the necessity? I think that is taught, is that how you were thinking it's framed? That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, okay. and, and, and I'm struggling with the idea of using it versus publishing it. You know, I, right. I understand that, that the statute allowed for the NDA to be able to protect information from being disclosed through the Public Records Act. And I'm a little bit struggling with the idea that um, the same request could be made today to a researcher. We would say no under the NDA but that we would not just use that information, but actually publish the exact information ourselves. I find that that's kind of a, I don't know what the word is, and Todd knows I'm struggling with this. I, it, it's not a frustration of the law, but it, it feels just, you know, I don't know what the word is. It's just a collision there that makes me uncomfortable. Uh, that we, uh, we only, the NDA allows us to use, doesn't, allow us to disclose otherwise I don't I, I otherwise I think that then this should have been disclosed to the requester you know of a through a public records law if we're, we're going to do exactly the same thing as what would have happened to the public records law uh, and I'm, I, I'm just struck in, by that in your, collision in, in your scenario and, and, and I understand you know the the, the everybody's input here. But in, in your scenario, the way I would reconcile it is by that level of detail. Um, that, you know, oh, we, oh, but I'm saying the exact same thing, the number, just exactly what, whatever exactly our researchers want. If the journalist or the researcher came in and asked for exactly that, exactly that, under the NDA, we would say no. Not about the detail or anything, exactly whatever we would plug in whatever. We would say no to the public records requester, but we would say we deem it necessary to disclose. But we don't have permission to disclose under the NDA. We have permission to use if deemed necessary. And so I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm struggling from the idea that use means publish only because of that collision of logic. I mean, maybe if I didn't see it so much, you know, that collision, I wouldn't have dealt with use and publishing as much. But you know, the idea of an NDA is it's a non-disclosure agreement. You're, you're not publishing stuff. Yeah, let, let, let me see if I understand uh, your point from this other other standpoint. Um, in other words, that this other researcher could come in, this, this hypothetical researcher, a second one, important. Uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Not, not our own. If they said, well, I want to corroborate what they, what the mm -hmm. researchers did, no, well, not say, even that. Not even that. Just or, out or of the no, blue. No, I want to do out my own. Blue. Yeah, I want to do my own study. Mm -hmm. Let's say, mm -hmm. and I want all the detail that that we know you must have gotten. Um, you know, because from from non gaming revenue, we would say no. We can only give you the one number, which actually is already published. That we already published. Um, is that is that against your point? The no, the I'm difference? just saying. So uh, whatever because I'm actually not involved enough in the detail to know, thank goodness, to actually know what is the number or whatever the researchers want that Mr. Stratton on behalf of his client is objecting to. Um, whatever it is though, let's say it's ABC. I want ABC and no, you know, under the NDA, if Todd got that public record request, no ABC is protected under our NDA, we will not disclose it to you. And what I'm hearing is that, however, the exception, as we're interpreting it, could be, we could use ABC, but now do we make the jump? Can we, if we deem necessary, publish ABC? And, yeah. and I'm, I'm having trouble making that jump in light of that collision with the- Isn't publishing disclosing? Well, yes. disclosing no, no, or publishing, no, it is, exactly, it the same, it same word, it, say exactly, it, yeah, the same yeah. thing. If you say that Just, using encompasses publishing, then it's the exception that swallows the rule. But it doesn't say disclose in that exception, uh, Gail, it says use, and so I wondered if, if, if that had been, you know, part of the thinking, you know, it didn't say disclose no, or publish. My, my, my point in that comment was that if we interpret use, to encompass publishing and somehow publishing is distinct from disclosure. 
Unless oh, we do that, uh, yeah. I don't know how you like it. Yeah, I don't see that distinction. Yeah, okay, I understand. Well, my, maybe, let, let me say this. Um, I guess it was assumed by me, I assumed that we would use all these data to publish it, that the, the, the purpose, the That's purpose true. of using all of this, and there was one and only, and that is to inform the public. So there would be a disclosure of the data, and that's the way, and I understand very much your arguments, by the way. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I, I don't guess know. I, but, but what but, about, but, like, but to me, I that, never that, assumed that, Enrique. I, I have to tell you, I, I don't think I ever assumed that that meant um, using the data meant publishing, especially public, with the non disclosure involved. No, using the data and, meant publishing findings, and findings could be summarized and reported, of course, with, without all the detail. But you um, wouldn't do that in the course of an investigation. And that part of that, that exception is, is contemplates, you know, for the purposes of an investigation, you needed to have something that was critical to maybe suitability that was somehow protected. Again, I, you know, I'm kind well, of- I, 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 think that's, I think that's a good, a, a good example. We don't, we never disclose all of the details uh, that of, of the financial in, on the investigations, for example, we come on and say, you know, recommended for suitability. But that's a good finding. That's ultimately a finding that but the you public don't publish. You don't know. publish what is protected. Yeah. You don't yeah. disclose yeah. what's protected. Right. If I could uh, just chime in, um, referring to section 71, 23K71, that, that calls for the commission to carry out a research agenda. And it specifically calls out comprehensive studies of the social and economic yeah. Um, impacts. And, and I would say that this piece of data, though it's one number, is incredibly important for us to be able to fulfill that piece of a comprehensive study of the economic impacts of... Ex ex except for one thing, it also does, and I think Enrique led with this, it's apparently information that our licensee doesn't want publicly disclosed, and presumably because it, it's a commercial competitive consideration and perhaps other things but I think Enrique raises that that's the balance so we're you're absolutely right Mark you know but for this MDA it would be great information that you know the Commonwealth could benefit from to understand but we're, we're sort of in this paradigm of figuring out that you know that 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 it is protected under the NDA for exactly why we get to have an NDA otherwise this would be subject to public records request because yeah, there's, no, there's no trade secret exception under the public records law the nda it's, it's a, actually the legislature contemplated that there would be this point this kind of information that at a certain point the licensees would just say it would put us at a com competitive disadvantage and it needs to be protected. this case Can is, I ask if oh, yes. there's a way in terms of um speaking specifically about this report mark and, and today and your desire to finalize the publication of it. Um, there is a way the researchers compiled their estimate based on another, in another way. Um, that information may or may not um, be corroborated by the actual facts that we got from MGM. Is there in fact a way to use that estimation and reference whether or not we believe there's a level of accuracy in that estimation? And Todd, this is somewhat to you as well, in a manner just for this immediate purpose that doesn't violate anyone's interpretation of the NDA. Not resolving the tension, right, just for the purposes of this report and what you wanted to put in, is there a way of drafting this using the estimated value and some indication of the reliability of that estimation that then does not violate disclosure that, that wouldn't mean publishing is somehow disclosing in violation of the NDA? Um, for the first part, yes, um, Commissioner O'Brien. I think that um, the, the report was released, or a report, the information was presented in a way that used estimations. Um, and I would, I would advise our, our research team to go forward with that. The second part of your question is, is a little more complicated um, regarding whether or not we can provide some type of indication whether that's, um, that, you know, the accuracy of that data. I would leave that, well, I believe, to our, our council and, and I would want to discuss with um, our research yeah. team. 
Mm -hmm. um, one, that's an appropriate use that is not publication that then becomes a disclosure that's violated by the NDA. My, my gut feeling, and this is purely just my, my feeling, is that um, if, we, if we try to put in some sort of qualifier to that, it, it would be, it could be perceived wrongly because we know what it approximates to, I guess. We know the data. You know, we already, we've already, you know, we personally, but our researchers have already seen that, that data. So, um, so long as, and, and, and they're the ones who brought up, we can estimate it in this other way and we would, we would be solidly right. no, but I'm thinking on, on there, our footing. It's stuff that's been wrongly disclosed, arguably there's clawback provisions and mechanisms in the law that say, I know you got it, but you got it erroneously and so you can't take it and I know you know it, but you're not gonna be able to use it. So you need to sort of separate yourself from that. If that's what we're saying today, however, use to me, has a number of different meanings. And even if we're saying we don't believe that use encompasses publication because that would then conflict with disclosure, is there another avenue for the use of that information that corroborates the estimation that is helpful to this? So the fact that we know it already as a legal construct doesn't answer the question. Like there, there are ways to claw that back and then go forward. And, and maybe there's a way to use this data without publishing it. But, yeah, but, for also, but, but one point though, is that we use it if we deem it necessary. So right. there still needs to be a consensus that it's deemed necessary by us, correct? Right. I, mean, I, I for one do think it's necessary. I think Mark has made it pretty clear it's necessary to the, the research agenda and the directions of the statute. So if, if we're doing that consensus, I would say I do think using it is necessary. Yeah, I would, I would probably, uh, struggle with finding the the information necessary deeming it necessary and so the, you know it's interesting at this point and just to get to that to what commissioner stevich just said and commissioner o'brien's question it's important to remember of course that this is a tricky situation because we already have the information in theory when we asked for it they could have said well i'm not going to give it to you well, um, and then yeah, but, we and then we could have had this conversation at an we, earlier stage where we wouldn't have known. But remember, so now, we are the regulator. And, yes. Well, and they weren't going to do that. Mr. Stratton did answer and did say, but so they yeah, weren't going to. They certainly yeah. weren't going to do that. And but um, we could have discussed this perhaps in an earlier stage. The the issue now, as others have already mentioned, is that since we know the number. It's harder to come up no. with uh, another way to. It's it's it. not it's not. This happens all the time where information gets conveyed and then you must not use it unless it's you know appropriately available. Yeah. It happens in in lots of contexts. I, yeah, I no. think uh, you know Eileen just mentioned the clawback. You know, we've done it. We've done. I've done it here with all of you. So, uh, you know that that's an available tool. Uh, can should we find out if we have a consensus on even if we deem if we were to deem it useful uh, necessary today? I don't know. I'm, I'm not convinced it's necessary today. I, I haven't heard enough about why it is. Frankly, I mean, I had a conversation with our general counsel, but we did not spend a lot of time on um, why it is. And I did read, but I, I, I'm still. I, I guess I'm not comfortable saying I. I absolutely believe it's necessary. Uh, I'm with you. I'm. That's why I thought we should. I, when I heard Commissioner Stebbins, I wasn't sure. I. I am. Um, I understand the public interest in this number. Yes. But I absolutely do. Um, I. I think there was an NDA put in place, and I believe that there was a reliance that this information is protected under the NDA. I understand there's some counter arguments today that we haven't chewed on. I think Gail and I are aligned on that. Um, but. Even if we if we had had that, um, if it weren't protected, we wouldn't be here. You know, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So there was a presumption coming in that it was protected. Um, you know, and then I, I just am not sure, given the competing interests of the NDA and the use versus publication, I'm just not there yet either. Um, I understand why it's a good number, but I also understand why you may have protected this information back when the NDAs were signed. Mm -hmm. So then from an operational level, because I realize there's no vote today, so um, 
I could guess be, my could we visit and and yeah, well, convince us on necessity. Right. So my question for Mark is more on, on the operational side rather than the decision making side. Is that given this this robust conversation and there's some consternation and you know this is a tricky issue. Is it your opinion it'd be better to just get this report out now uh, with the, the information either redacted or not included, and then we'll revisit this issue in the long term? Or do you want to wait and hold on to the report and then come back before the commission and really you know, dig down and, and actually vote on this? Do you have any thoughts one way or the other or any commissioner's thoughts on that? Well, let, let me suggest uh, that as perhaps the, the one in the minority uh, that, um, that we move ahead without that information in the report um, because the, the idea of bringing this in, because I, I seem to hear a, a level of discomfort relative to, you know, the use and, and, and publishing. Um, that we move ahead with the report, it's been, it's done, you know, the, the, the idea of having this discussion was so that the one year report, which is, this is, this is meant to, to be, doesn't get to be you know two years later right, say. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so um, you know that that they finish the report there's a lot more information as has been stated here that was that is very relevant in the report we we got we, we got to participate in a public um presentation uh, which and this is only one of the reports that was presented then um, so there's a lot of benefit in terms of public interest relative to information contained therein, and uh, and we can just direct our researchers to expunge that, and and then you know have, make the decision as to whether they can um, you know have an estimate with some methodology that is described that makes no use of that data um, when it comes to non-gaming revenue, and then move that forward. Can That's I, if, my recommendation. To if there's government. anything around, if there's anything around this issue, though, and I know you know the idea of not using it, um, I do think it would be a good courtesy to share it with um, MGM in advance um, to make sure that we're all in agreement that it's you know protecting that. Unless we come back, right? Um, I think that's a courtesy. Amika, you would probably agree with that, right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, I've seen that they've seen um, at least version, a version of these uh, is my understanding. But, uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. We would not want to inadvertently <laughs> think we were, you know, that's offline right. and, and find out later yeah. that the damage was done. Yeah. And I, I would advise the research team to proceed with the methodology that they used to create, to, to produce that data. Um, during the, the research day last month. Um, and that methodology was vetted by MGM and we we're, we were um, all in agreement that that was fine. So I will certainly work with, um, with uh, our licensees on, on that and make sure that we're all on the same page. It's an important piece of kind of finalizing that report. Right. And then if we could go back to Commissioner O'Brien, I think your initial point that maybe this is a topic for a bigger conversation Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, well, I think decide what use means, and I and I think there's some level of agreement that publish is not used because it would violate the, the directives in the NDA to not disclose. But I do think we need to have a, another conversation about what does use mean, so we don't find ourselves getting in a in a situation like this again. Yeah, and I also think it's fair to revisit just uh, I think non gaming revenue, um, and perhaps mm -hmm. with our our licensees to see. You know, at what point would they ever be comfortable? Um, but this, at this point, it would be premature to, to release it. I mean, yeah. I think, okay. So twofold. Okay. Is that helpful? Do you get, is that, you know, I don't think you need a vote. Or no, you, because I think you'd need a vote in order to make that determination of the, of the necessity okay. and use. But if, if we're not, if we're not there, if there's no vote towards that, that at least gives uh, Mark some direction and made a note to put the NDA on our agenda setting meeting notes so this can be a, a topic going forward and look at it broadly because this is going to be an annual report this is only one report we're going to be doing this for years and years and years yeah that's right Commissioner Cameron are you all set I am thank you Commissioner Stebbins uh, I am and and just to, to chime in on Commissioner Zuniga's point I'm you know, a lot of research was talked about at the public presentation and, you know, I'm, I'm 
I'm not for holding that up and allowing for what everybody's comfortable with to be published. And we'll, we'll still have this one issue kind of hanging out there. But I don't want to slow Mark down in the, in, the, in the great research team that he works with. And to Mark's point, it's vital information. It's just that we're weighing the other, the other side. So today, um, this is where we, we, come, we come out, but I think there are future conversations to address you know, what you, you find to be um, appropriately paramount. So um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Zuniga, are you all set? Yep, all set. Commissioner O'Brien? Yeah, I'm all set, thank you. All right, good. You got thank your marching you. orders uh, on that. Thank um, you, I, I, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, okay. Well, the magic ended <laughs> on our timing. Yeah. We're doing really well. Um, we do have a time for commissioners' updates, and I hope that just because we're running a little late, you, you'll still feel free to give any updates that you have. Uh, just one update, and it kind of just stems from our last discussion. I mean, we're not out really getting out and about anywhere these days, but uh, just to, to thank my colleagues who have uh, uh, a law degree and a legal background, it's uh, your your input into the conversation is greatly appreciated by the non-lawyer in the room. We'll have to record that when the lawyer jokes come yes. up later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I tell you, you're not the only one. You're not the only non-lawyer. It's being recorded. I didn't pause it. Sometimes that gets in the way of getting to good logical conclusions <laughs> to answers. Um, but uh, OK, so that was a, a kind of an almost update. Uh, any other update? We'll, we'll take the compliment, though. Thank you. No. No, Eileen, I'm sure you feel the same way. Uh, we're trying to put that law degree behind us in this role, as opposed to... <laughs> law school messes with you, changes the way you think about everything. It does. It does. <laughs> All right. Um, any other update? Commissioner Cameron, do any update if you look out the window? <laughs> no, no, no update at all. Thank you. Well, it's going to be 70 degrees here yeah. on Saturday. So anyway, um, to all the uncertainties in our world, um, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed and let's uh, you know, think about all those who are dealing with the, um, the public health issues today. And, and let's just all pray for a, a bit of a turnaround in the near future and a little certainty um, sooner than later. So thank you, and thank you for the excellent meeting. Lots of territory covered today, right? The big one. It was, yeah. you know, it shows the breadth of um, the team's work, Karen, and it makes our job really interesting, don't you think, commissioners? We're lucky. Absolutely. Yes. All righty. So, Madam Chair, I move to adjourn. Thank you. Aye. Okay, all those in favor, just aye. 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 Bye. Bye. All righty. Thank you, everyone. We adjourn. Five Bye. zero.